Hey everybody, welcome to the Joint Select Board and Trustee meeting for Tuesday, today's Tuesday, April 9th, 2019. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll call the Select Board meeting to order. And I will call the Essex Junction Trustee meeting to order. Great. First order of business is agenda additions and changes. And um, Evan and Greg, I believe we have no additions from you. No additions, but I believe you're going to change the order around just a little bit. Getting right to that. Um, items 5D and 5E, we're just going to swap them. We're going to tackle 5E first and 5D second. So that's all that is. And then we will be ha being joined by a guest, Dan Richardson, an attorney from Montpelier who's been consulting with the boards on our governance conversations. So he'll be joining us shortly when he gets here and we get to that part of the meeting. Yep. <coughs> so, um, select board, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. And a second? A uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'll make the <coughs> same request of the trustees. So moved. A second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And I just, I'll just add for the trustees, Trustee Lori Houghton will be joining us shortly. She's over at the, at the high school in Pulse. I think that's where she was. Right. So the next item on the agenda is public to be heard. This is the part of the meeting when the public can speak on items that are not already on the agenda. So if anybody would like to say something regarding something that we're not going to cover tonight, please feel free. Margaret. Just a reminder, please speak to the microphone. Elaine, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. We're Sorry. We're sharing this one. So I, I know, I know, okay. still. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Items not on the agenda. Betsy. I would ask that um, I don't believe when I was reading the paper about what all the governance issues you're going to do, but are we going to also have um, a conversation about Australian ballot versus voting at the, at the um, for our budget? I think tonight we're going to talk about the many different things we're going to have to ask the voters at some point, Great. and how we vote may come up. Okay. It might not be here tonight, but it's most definitely a conversation for the future. Thank you. All right. Other members of the public have anything to add? Any other questions, comments? Okay, thanks. Oh, Irene. There was an issue with the mic on Monday night. So I'm glad to see there's a mic for the audience tonight because people called and complained they couldn't hear the audience comments on the videotape. Oh, so for okay, future reference, keep bringing it. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go into business items. Um, Greg, you're going to be joining us shortly. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to keep you apprised of the progress that's happening with the uh, unified website. Um, Basically, Civic Plus, which is the company that's been working on it, has drafted up a template um, color scheme that was included in your packet. Rob and I can speak to that um, if there's any questions to it. At this point, uh, the staff, the communications team, has been working on the website, has submitted their comments on, um, on that template back to Civic Plus. Uh, we have also collected input from department heads and board members, um, which uh, we will be organizing and going through and um, figuring out feedback on that, how to best incorporate that in the website. The comments are included in your packets. Um, we have a draft survey that we'd like to put up on the websites for residents to try to get some feedback from the public on what they would be looking for in websites. And lastly, uh, Rob has put together a list of IP, a list of web addresses that the town and village own, um, use, do not use, and other ones that might be options that are out there that are not yet uh, owned by anybody. Um, so that's basically the quick overview, but we can fill you in and answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Select board, anybody, any comments, questions, thoughts? I was just wondering if it would make sense to um, sort of um, do a pilot program with the change and have it uh, just on the town side first. Um, and the town one really needs an update for sure. And uh, work out the bugs um, on, on the town side and then um, 
say in a year and a half or so, maybe we'll be able to, uh, you know, to, to merge the two uh, in, into one website. But I was thinking rather than trying to do the whole thing together, and I know there's some issues on the village side with some of the existing um, websites that are great and already out there, if it might make sense to approach it as a pilot project on the town side. Um, I think that's a good, that's a great idea. I just don't know in terms of the complexity, if that, how that works for you, Rob and uh, Greg. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, certainly we can update the town website on its own and see how it looks and see how it feels for the public. Um, the challenge there, it, it's only part of the issue. Um, <clears throat> Big picture, we're looking at the website update as part of a broader communication strategy to, to help reach um, the entire community. Part of it is administrative. Uh, Rob and his team are they're managing 14 websites right now. Um, so it, a revised, updated look to the town website is only part of um, what we're trying to do. It, it certainly can be done. It's just it only resolves part of the, um, the issues that we're trying to tackle. And, and then there's the cost piece of it, too. If, uh, the, the contract that's been signed at this point has been for um, a comprehensive website for, for both municipalities. Um, and there would be a cost, I, Rob could probably tell me better what that was going to be, but there would be a cost associated with doing part of it now and part of it in a year and a half, two years from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one of the, the other issues is that by having it separate, you're we're definitely losing a lot of the uh, benefits of having a, a unified website. Uh, search capability, the consistency that you, the, the user has as they're going between the pages. Um, the, as far as the cost um, is concerned, depending on how long it's delayed or, I mean, even if it's a one year, one year out, pro year and a half out project or delayed for that long, um, it's Civic Plus is char would be charging us $150 an hour for for that additional work. So a big chunk of this is by designing it uh, at this point is to kind of keep that cost down so that we're not having to spend for a complete redesign in a year, year and a half. Um, and part of one of the benefits of using them, and I know I've highlighted it in the past, is that in four years we're able to do a redesign. And part of this website, while it's a unified website, it, you can really look at it as multiple websites. So it's really not a, a matter of um, just a website where it's for the town or for the village or for <coughs> both. Um, it's You can look at it as f essentially four different websites that we're going to have, but all combined, all interacting with one another. Um, and we would definitely lose that. And on top of it, it be, like Greg was saying, the administrative uh, piece of it is is quite um, quite a bit for us. Well, the, the only thing I... Uh, uh, Andrew, what you think? What well, I was curious on, as you mentioned, about using the results from the <coughs> survey to help inform next steps, at least I think is how I understood it. When I see the feedback from the board uh, about what we want to see in the unified website, I see three out of four comments say that we don't want it from board members. So I'm curious how you would use that to inform this process. I think we would need a vote from the boards, uh, for one of the boards, and a motion to proceed or not proceed. Um, it's, it's, there were four of you who responded, even on one board, that's the quorum, but I think that's between the two boards. Um, we don't need a motion tonight, but probably in the near future, so Rob can figure out what he's um, working with Pacific Plus on. I, I want to go back and just discuss uh, Max's idea for a second, because there, it also gets around, you know, we, we, the, the main item we're talking about tonight is, is governance change. And uh, a year from now, two years from now, we could be, it, it, it's conceivable that depending on how we change our governance structure, you could wind up having to completely reconfigure your website. So, you know, maybe Max's idea isn't that bad, not only, not only for the reasons that Max gave, but also because 
it might bring you, by the time you get done doing this pilot, you might have a little bit more clarity about where we're going. So you might have a little more certainty about how, what ultimately, uh, if you're going to, this is going to be a big expenditure, you probably want to have something that's locked in for like, many years. And it, it's something that could potentially change significantly depending on how we decide, what we're, where we decide to go with governance. Mm -hmm. Yep, I that, do understand that, uh, yeah. and that's kind of how why we designed it this way, where we <coughs> we set separated the website. So the the way the pages or sites are laid out, um, each each municipality would get what's called a department header, and under that is that municipality's entire website. So <coughs> while while it could change in a year and a half, the governance. The website itself would still be a separate component than a unified um, site. That's kind of the that's part of the reason it was designed this way, so that it was never intended to um, to completely to uh, put into place a, a unified or just one website. Uh, and I know that was mentioned uh, early on, but that was now certainly never the intention. Rob, if I could just clarify that, it'd be one platform, it'd be, yes. but it'd be Correct. Sorry. potentially different home pages. Yeah. Is that a better way to say it? Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I have two things I'm looking for clarity for, not exactly for myself, but more for people um, maybe watching Channel 17 later on or now. Um, uh, my my first question is, Greg, uh, your final sentence before involved. It I couldn't decide. It seemed to me you were either speaking to gathering all the websites that we have out for a variety of different reasons mm -hmm. and making sure that they're gathered in correctly. Mm -hmm. But were you also speak? And I see I'm correct. Were you also speaking about a domain name, or am I confused about that part? No, at some point, uh, there's a, Rob has a list of all the domain names that are in use right now between For, the town under and the village. The, yeah. uh, sorry. At, at a certain point, um, I guess two steps and jump in, Rob, if I misspeak. Uh, there's going to be have to be a home page, or basically an address where the, the site can be built. And so it, let's just call it, um, uh, let's call it Vermont.com, to keep sure. it simple. Um, Civic Plus can build it on Vermont.com, and it would be a template and be built on the website. When it's ready to go live, that's when it would link to a name. Mm -hmm. And whether that's yeah. Essex.org or EssexJunction.org. And the way it's set up right now, jump in when I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. um, it could be set up so that if you type in Essex.org, it would take you to the town portion of the site. If you type in EssexJunction.org, it would take you to the village portion of the site. Depending on how you want to structure it, if you want to have one landing page for the Essex community, you, you could come up with the Essex community dot whatever, and then from there go to the town piece, the village piece, everything else. Is that right? Does that answer your question? What if mm -hmm. the village and the village website maintained as is you kitted it out so that it was possible you you utilize the information on the current village site format it out without too much effort I'm not talking about spending a lot of time or money on that idea conceptually you kit it out so that it could pull that stuff in don't send it there yet know that you could keep the website you have everybody stays happy that part doesn't go live it's not too much you don't get too invested in it but you take the time to make the possibility be there while also doing that idea whatever and then everything just kind of sits still until such time as we want to go forward am i making any sense it makes sense absolutely so i feel like everything can happen for everybody because I understand. I'm not, I, I don't understand how hard it is to do the part from the back end, but I'm thinking if you could kind of sort of conceptualize it, but not kit it out completely, just kind of format it, 
let it live there, not live. Let it be a possibility. Still keep the village set as it is. We figure out what we're doing to move forward. And then such time as need be, it, it's not that hard, hopefully, to do. Is that silly? So, can I, can I, if uh -huh. I understand, so basically build a new website, kind of do a rougher framework of the village portion of that website, but keep the village current village website live? Is that Yes. That's kind of the approach we were going on oh. <laughs> already. Great. And so that it was never a, a point where we couldn't turn um, turn on this new site and continue to operate with the old site working. Um, but part of, and certainly part of bringing stuff over is is using the current stuff that's there, using features that that are. Um, a pop that people have positive feedback on content and stuff like that. So that you know is definitely part of the plan. Um, as far as that the village site is concerned, I mean we literally could take that whole site and just drop it into into the Civic Plus site, and it would look exactly as it is now. Uh, it would just be on a different platform, and so it's it certainly doesn't take away from. Um, the existing look or feel to it, uh, but it's just on a different platform. I, I, I'm kind of just saying, yes, I'm in agreement with that, but maybe before we move it, we make sure what we're doing so that you're over there with the, hey, I'm ready, and they're over there with, we're not ready yet, and then when everybody is agreement, you. So I, I have a question that I would apologize for being late. Um, and I'm, I am a very optimistic person about our future, but I have to play the devil's advocate. So what happens if we move forward with this unified website, and in two years, we aren't together? How do we back out of the website? What happens then? I would ask, are you going to separate your, separate into two IT departments that are then managing two websites? I mean, who knows? Oh, we don't know. We don't know that. We don't know, um, and that's my point. And so that was my point when, I brought this up at the last village meeting. I mean, we just don't know our future, and and this is our public face. I I I'm I'm, I'm responding, but I'm going to be over here. Well, here you can. I can do this. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to talk. I, <laughs> so it's on yours. Okay, I'm trying to. The the thing is, I I what I would the way I'd respond to it, Lori, is I'd say that what we're anticipating is when we if we put a governance option on in front of the voters in 2020 and it is not approved, um, then what we would in effect be voting for is to maintain the existing status quo where we have a shared administration. So we'd continue to have a shared administration. That would be the default. And I think that um, a, a continued shared administration to say we would continue to have a, sh then you'd, you'd have a, a shared, you wouldn't have a shared website, but you'd have one administration operating the, the, the website that they're talking about now. I don't see, I mean, I, do you really think that it's a, a likely possibility that we would split so far, suddenly split so far apart that we would not, no longer have to uh, share the administration? Based on our history, based on our, based on our history of these discussions over many, many, many years, I thought by now we would be one, but we're not. Okay. So I... I would hope that, that what you say would happen, but I'm not banking on it, and I'm not ready to give up the village identity to gain some efficiencies when in a year and a half or two years, we will have a much better idea of our future. Well. So um, I'm hearing that the trustees might need to do a little bit more discussion on the matter than we have time for this evening. I think you guys need to have a more substantive discussion, and then Greg needs official direction from the trustees. I don't know if you want to do that tonight or if you want to do it at your next meeting. Well, I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear from the other trustees. Dan and Andrew, what are your thoughts on this? I hear what Lori's saying, and uh, I agree 
to an extent, but I also understand what you're saying, George, that are we really, get, do we need to, um, I'm hesitant to, to, to give up too much right off. There's a lot of things I question, you know, the, the control over the website, um, just knowing our practice on doing things in the village in the way the town that my experience, the way they do things, it's, it's not the same. Um, and it's obvious from polls and everything else we've seen. So that's not that, 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 that everybody's going to do that. And the process for, for um, controlling this system, you're ultimately going to be the, the webmaster or whatever your title is, right, for this? No, I mean, we're the IT department's ultimately right, in charge right, of it, yeah. Right. But you don't, right now, for, well, you do with our, our website as it is now. Rob's controlling our website now. So I guess it's. Right. I mean, it's. Uh, think it's, of what the difference would be. I mean, we're. It's, it's, it would be, I don't think that the people feeding into the website, putting, posting things on the website is, would be different. I think that's, there's two different components um, in terms of who's posting information content on the website. That's one, and tell me if I'm wrong, and then, but Rob, Rob is, they're basically providing the platform. Yeah. Yes. But if ahead. I could, IT does not control content. Right. They control the, well, they administer the contract, they help the <coughs> departments, but in general, the idea was there'd be communications uh, committee and people from the village and the people from the town are responsible, the departments, are responsible for their own content. Mm -hmm. IT doesn't create content for their or anybody's site. But let's just say, for instance, administration says, hey, we need the following minutes put up. More than likely, it would be Darby or Tammy or someone else that's not going to be IT that does it. IT will do it if nobody else is available. Or for the sake of meeting a state deadline, Let's say we needed the minutes up on Friday, everybody went home, we could contact IT and say we have these minutes because they could do it remotely, they don't have to be in the office. But they're not creating the content. So if the village wanted to do a poll, the only thing the village needs to do is contact the person who's actually responsible for the village website, which in this particular case would be Darby and or Tammy and or someone else and say, We'd like the following poll run. That's how it would work. Right. Dale? Um, earlier, Greg said something about um, <clears throat> when Annie asked the question about developing this new website for the community as a whole and maybe keeping in the, <clears throat> in the back set not active our website so that when, like Annie was saying, when, once we decide as a community to come together that they can merge the, the system so it, it activates all together. Um, but you said something, Greg, about the, it's going to be on a different platform. Can you explain when you say different platform, what do you mean? What Define platform for me. And um, I, I just my concern is people out in the village that are used to seeing the village website have now this new system they get, or new, you know, uh, address or a website, they're going to go on, they're going to see something different, it's going to be confusing. Um, I think people are very comfortable with what they have now mm -hmm. and they don't want to see it change. Sure. Whether it's a website or whether it's the, the highway department, the way they do certain things in the village and, and you know, not to say that they're not working together as it is now, but some things are done differently in different places and it's just... Yeah, so speaking to the website, um, again, Rob, jump in when I have time to speak, but there's 14 different websites right now. I don't know how many different providers we have, how many different um, uh, um, structures and, and management, web management languages, languages that 14. when the IT department has to post something, they, they post it differently on, I won't say 14 different ways, yeah. but a lot of different ways depending on the website. So um, going to one platform is basically having the same provider the same architecture for every single one of those websites. You can still set it up when you get there, you can still set it up so the look can look like 
um, the current town website, it still look like the current village website, it still look like <coughs> the current fire department website. The look of the website can be tailored within a, within a platform. The platform has the platform isn't going to be something anyone on the front end sees. It's all on the back end stuff. So that's the only difference. And it's a unif it's a single platform versus fourteen different platforms. So where you can't where none of those sites are communicating to each other. <coughs> so the, having this is you know that one benefit that you know, the residents are able to really kind of get out of a single website, a search function that actually finds stuff, you know, not having to go to potentially 14 different websites to find information uh, as it is now. I mean, you could do a Google search and find stuff and sort through it. But if you could just go to the one website and do a search for it, it would, that would be the ideal situation. So, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. this is, this agenda item is, there's nothing for the select board to vote on here. This is an information only kind of discussion. So I just want to wait, check in with all the select board members, see if you have any further thoughts or questions. Matt? If it's transparent to the user, um, so they won't see a difference, but it's easier uh, for the IT department to maintain, it sounds like a no-brainer, to say get to the same platform, but don't change the look and feel of the Village website, at least not the live version, Maybe do what Annie was saying and work, which is what you're going to do on the town side anyway, right? As you're working on it, it's going to be mm -hmm. offline. Mm -hmm. So kind of do what you plan anyway, but maybe just bring the town one online first until the trustees are, are ready or if we have better, you know, headlights as far as what the governance structure would be in the year and a half or so. But I would think we, it's a no-brainer to go to the same platform if it's transparent to the user. Okay. I mean, that's definitely certainly could do that. Okay. I mean, there's definitely cost associated with it, though, because okay. part, so, of, part of the plan was to eliminate some of these other sites. So, you know, recouping those, that amount uh, you know, that wasn't planned for. So, one of, so I'm, I, I'm guessing I understand that there, there is kind of a plan for moving ahead, keeping the village site in, 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 intact and intact and um, not changing anything in terms of what the village website is doing right now in terms of our ability to put content on it and so forth. Um, and but you're going to move ahead with the plan to just develop the town, uh, use the, develop the town website first. That's the concept right now. We could, we could basically build both websites on the on, a new, on the new platform. Right. Make the town website look different. Give it the upgrade that it needs. Okay. Keep the village website. Basically, looking the same, same functionality that it, since it doesn't need the, the full, full revamp that the town one does. Okay. I'm thinking we can probably come back at a certain point and say, here's the template on one platform, here's what it's going to look like. Okay. If the trustees are happy with it, great. Okay. If they're not, it's there. The other village, the current village site, stays live, it stays active. If and until the time comes to slip it up. Let me, let me stop you there. So if someone out in the world, mm -hmm. not in this room, someone out in the world Googles Essex Junction, they're going to go to EssexJunction.org and see an Essex Junction website. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. that's, that's still going to be there. They're not going to go to an Essex community website and then they have a sublink that goes to Essex Junction. Correct? So trustees, um, what do you think? Do you want to just give the, I don't know if we need the voter to sort of give a nod of consent to move forward with this concept and then we'll, we'll see what happens in a, a month or so. What are you thinking, Andrew? I, I like the sound of Essex Junction being its own website, its own organization. I frankly don't understand how the back end of things work. Okay. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, as long as we have our own community website, our own Essex Junction website, that's fine by me. Okay. Well, what direction do we do we want to give to? Because I think we need to kind of wrap this up when we make a decision and, and move on here. So what, what's the My opinion, I, I I have no problem with moving forward with what what we've just discussed. The whole thing of you know moving forward, developing the, the unified website with both, but right. keep ours active until such time that we decide that okay we're comfortable enough with, and maybe the people inside the town residents within the village who are when I go to the website for the town right now, I think it's just terrible. It's it's something <coughs> I could see a kid in high school developing. Now, this this Actually, thing give them more 
getting well, to see. Well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> getting better than that. But I'm just saying that once We're the people what <laughs> see what they, what, what is put together with this, you know, new website the town has, they may say that, boy, this is quite nice. And maybe you'll get some feedback from other than just us, the residents outside of the village, in, in the village, whatever. The, the residents within the village may <coughs> compare it to, to the village website. I don't know how much use their village website gets from people outside the village, but who knows? Okay. Is that, do we have a con, do we have an answer? Is there an answer in here? We get it? Yeah. Annie? Sorry. I think that it wouldn't hurt you to also be able to get to the Essex Junction website from the town one. Sure. It wouldn't hurt. That if they were looking for you, they could find you either way. Yeah. Well, they can do that. They can Interim, do that. They can, there can always be a link. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Do that exactly. Right no, now. exactly. They do that now. There's no problem with that right now. Yeah. So, are we, do we have an, an answer here? I think so. Okay. You have some guidance from us, Lori? I'm with Andrew. It has to be a town. I don't know the back workings, but it has to be EssexJunction.org until there is a governance solution. But it would be EssexJunction.org. Okay. <clears throat> So we're agreeing to one platform. Yes. Okay. Ready? Okay. I don't know if we need to vote on this, but let's just give the nod and see see where it goes. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Rob, thank you very much thank for you. your hard work. On this. Um. All right. Our next item: approve the schedule for future joint board meetings. Greg has come up with a nifty plan help us work more efficiently and to not put the staff through multiple hoops to share information with both boards. So share with us what you have, what you come up with. Sarah had a lot to do with this too. Oh, I thank you, see. Sarah. Because it involves a spreadsheet problem. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Uh, you thought she was going to get all that You know Sarah. <laughs> um, so staff's been having a lot of conversations lately. Um, about what we can do with, with the boards to, to kind of, I guess, meet more often. And as we look at it, there's just more and more overlapping issues that we need to deal with, website being a prime example, um, and being able to make sure we get the, the appropriate direction from the boards that we're looking for, make sure that staff can bring the boards um, materials in a timely manner. And if we keep doing the current schedule, is, is basically... Um, Select board meets the first and third Monday of every month. The trustees are the second and fourth. And every other month, the boards meet jointly. Um, that a lot of times, if, if there's something that is really timely, has to go to both boards. Staff is presenting materials twice. Uh, for example, Sarah gave a presentation to the trustees two weeks ago, maybe, about um, electronic AP <coughs> filling and invoicing. Uh, the select board is going to see that one on Monday. Um, Sarah's going to do that twice. Uh, really be great to have it those types of things once um, also looking at November 2020 uh, which we'll be talking about shortly um, that's coming up really really fast and if you meet every other month it's going to come up really really fast mm -hmm. um, so we looked at staff looked at some options of how to be able to bring you material more time in more timely manners um, have some better decision making uh, be able to get some clear direction um, as quickly as possible and we can keep doing the same schedule. Um, could also look at meeting, keeping us, your existing individual board meeting schedules, um, but meeting jointly once a month. That's more meetings for everybody. Staff's recommendation is to get rid of the every other first Wednesday of the, every other month meeting. Um, keep your current schedule for the first and third Monday, second and fourth Tuesday, but have the boards meet jointly within that schedule. Um, so the first Monday would be a select board meeting. We would stagger it so you could still do individual board business, um, probably take 30 minutes, 45 minutes at the beginning of each meeting to run through any board specific business. Um, then after that, meet jointly and, and do some of the, the joint stuff and get the updates and the decisions um, that are happening on a joint level, whether that's budgeting, whether it's governance, um, the many topics that are overlapping and intertwined right now. Uh, so looking at, yeah, the first, first meeting, um, of the first Monday being select board and then joint meeting, uh, second Tuesday being trustees, third meeting being, being select board, fourth meeting being trustees followed by a joint meeting. Um, in doing this, it, it'd be, they will be 
pretty busy meetings. Staff would probably be looking to put more items on the consent agenda. Um, we, you know, you're able to pull that off. We can talk about that discussion a little bit of when to pull something off consent agenda. Um, it'd be feeling out that process a little bit as to what you want to see, what you don't want to see. Um, some of the meetings might run late. The boards might have to meet, continue their individual meetings after a joint meeting, but that is our recommendation and um, hopefully the boards are amenable to that or there's something like it and willing to open it up to discussions, questions, anything else. <laughs> um, thank you, Greg and Sarah. This is challenging to try to make this work. <clears throat> And I appreciate especially that you gave us two different ways to look at it, one with text and one with calendars for visuals. So thank you for appealing to the visual learners among us. Um, I think this is a great suggestion. We have a lot of work to do. We have only a limited amount of time. And we have two very committed boards. So I would not want to waste anyone's time. And I think this is a convenient way to do it. It actually works out better for me because for the last year I've been attending all those meetings. So I actually get to do less meetings with this the way that you're recommending. So I would like to open it to the select board members for comments and questions about how you feel about this potential calendar. Pat. Um, the third option by far works the best for me uh, schedule-wise with my work schedule and with needing to avoid you know, other specific Tuesdays because of EWSD board meeting stuff that can't be moved. The, the third option is just by far my preference as well, since that seems to be the staff recommendation. I'm 100% behind it. Great. Andy? Uh, <clears throat> I just realized as you were going through it that I don't understand it anymore, option three. Um, so is, is, it, is the intent to have two joint meetings a month? Yes. So there are cases where the fourth Tuesday and the first Monday could be six days apart? Is that? <coughs> could be. The, the other option is if you did it always on select board, it'd be two weeks apart, but it'd always be a select board. Same if you did it always on trustees. If you did it in the two middle meetings, you're potentially six days apart. If you get the first and fourth, then occasionally there's some of those long months and it might be a week, week and a half in between. So we're, we're going from a meeting every other month to two meetings a month. That's four times as many meetings, joint meetings, right? Do we really need that? I, I don't, I'm not sure I see that for four times as many meetings. But am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, we had the, we had the topic this morning, or this moments ago, that I think was, was only a trustee issue. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering what what the yeah. I, I guess enough it, content for that many meetings. We would be feeling it out. I I think we're going to be plenty busy. Um, as you look at some of the stuff later on in this agenda, and as you start to talk about outreach and and governance proposals and everything else, um, once we get into budget season, so much of the budget is <coughs> intertwined now. So we start planning for that in September, October, um, meeting pretty much through. January, February on budget stuff. Uh, I, I would think if there's a night where there's nothing to put on there, we can notify the boards that it doesn't need to be a joint meeting for exactly. anything. Um, and for the website stuff, I mean, I, from staff perspective, we did need to hear from both boards on that. Um, <coughs> those things will change going forward, but it, it's to us that is an intertwined thing, and we're getting different sentiment, different feelings, at least it felt like that way to us from each board. We wanted to get you in a room and have that discussion together. I think one of the things, you know, Greg said is if there's nothing for both boards, whichever one's board meeting it is, you can cancel the other half and enjoy your night off. Um, but there's lots of things that as you move forward, there's going to be discussions on everything. Policy, procedure, assets, taxation, tax equity, any subcommittee maybe or any committee of the boards that you put together is probably going to do a report. You're going to have public input. You're going to have reports about any of the public outreach. Um, I just think you're going to be very busy and we'd like to be productive and I also think that as you need every other month, things get lost. 
Oh, I, I, I would I would agree that we may need to meet more frequently, but I would rather see it go to doubling rather than quadrupling the number of meetings we have to, to do it, you know, <clears throat> one meeting a month, and we could alternate between, you know, first select board meeting, first trustee meeting. So it's Tuesday, first Tuesday, first Monday, one, you know, and then one month, and then second Tuesday the next month, just and then and then assess whether or not we need to yet double it yet again. I'm, 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 I, I, I just, I, there's, there's a couple, you know, I, that, I, I don't know that there's enough content, and I, and, and, and as I said, we're quadrupling the number, and then the other thing is I don't want to shortchange our normal business either. If we have pressure to finish uh, a, a, a regular, you know, single board um, business agenda in half an hour, um, I don't want to tell people we can't, you can't, we can't take your input because we have to start a joint meeting. Or, or I, I, and I guess maybe that's the part of the discussion we need to have is how do we do that transition? How do we manage? You know, because it, it, you know, I look at I look at agendas all the time and I say, oh, this is going to be an easy one. We're going to be done really quick, and then it takes three hours, right? So, <laughs> you know, the sign never sign. made a dime betting on the length of meetings. Right, right. And so, so I'm, I'm I have a concern about about you know that running into a time constraint and feeling pressured to limit comment or discussion because there's a a following meeting, we've got other people waiting, and so yeah. I, I'd, I'd rather not have every other meeting have that pressure on it. Max, yeah, uh, to get to schedule ten people uh, at a meeting is is difficult to do, kind of spontaneously. I, I I agree. It looks like it's a it's a big increase, but our workload is going to be getting larger as well. I'd like to see us go forward with option three and get that on everyone's calendars. And if we don't need to meet for a joint meeting, then I'm sure it's, we're not gonna, we're not gonna meet just to, because it's on the calendar. But if it's not on the calendar and we need it, to schedule it is almost, it's very difficult. It's not possible, it's very difficult. Uh, and and to, uh, to be able to do the, say the select board business, before a joint meeting, we're going to need to do more consent items too, and, and that's you know kind of tricky business too because some of that does need you know discussion, so we need to be careful about that. Minutes can go go in there, things like that, unless there's a big change that, that are needed there. But I'd like to see us get this on the schedule and 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 say we're not going to use a date with as much lead time as we can give everybody, but rather than say oh something's important, we need to get everyone together, we can't. Because um, I do think the workload's going to increase pretty quick here. The November 2020 is not that far away. Annie, do you have any thoughts? I do have thoughts. Topic? <laughs> I have so many thoughts. Um, I respect and hear what Andy is saying. <clears throat> I do think um, I would very much like to try option three, but keeping in mind Andy's concerns. Um, because I do think that sometimes time management um, becomes, <coughs> things can become more effective and efficient once you kind of get involved in that kind of thing. And I think both boards were so wildly respectful of people's need to speak that we would figure out those pieces so that we never ever lost that, <clears throat> that ability. So I'd like to try, but I'd like to, to keep in mind Andy's concerns so that we grow forward intelligently and respectfully for all. Um, I, I kind of, I'm in agreement with Andy and Max and Annie, I, but I'm going to suggest a tweak. I, I like option three, but how about something a little bit different? Just in I, I, I do agree, the select board starting at seven and they've got a half an hour to get through a pretty big agenda and select board agendas can be pretty substantive and half an hour puts you under a lot of pressure. Um, the trustees meeting at 6.30 and the joint board meetings at 7.30, it, I'm wondering if it might be better to tweak option three and have uh, Monday first select board meeting just as usual and then second Tuesday trustees start meeting at 6.30 and then we have the joint meeting at 7.30 at the, at the trustees meeting um, and, then, and, then, and then the third Monday the select board uh, you do the same thing, um, but you have uh, 
maybe have the select board meeting start at 6.30 and have the joint meeting, if necessary, um, start at 7.30. But, um, and I, I agree with the sentiment that we should schedule it and build it in, but try um, very hard to just have one joint meeting. Try to, when we can, limit the joint meeting stuff to one of the joint meetings, one of the monthly joint meetings. The second one is on the books if, we, if necessary, but we would try to have the, uh, our joint meeting stuff handled at that first joint meeting um, that we have in, uh, on Tuesday. Is that, did, every, did I make sense? Did everyone catch what I said? Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Sorry. Um, the select board has already determined that due to work commitments by some of our members, we have to stick with 7 o'clock. Okay, start. okay, so, right. But I do like the idea of um, trying to limit it to one joint meeting, but having two just in case. Yeah. But we can't start earlier than Okay, seven. all right. Okay. Annie? Self <clears throat> selfishly, I'm super nervous if we move it from Monday to Tuesday for the joint. I, the second Tuesday. It's my favorite Tuesday to not be at I have another commitment, but but I can give it up. But I don't want to, but I could. Okay. Julie really noted. Um, All right. So the sense I have of the, the sense I have of the select board is that we are all uh, that Pat, Annie, Max, and myself are in favor of option three. And Andy, you're you have a concern about having more than one joint meeting a month. How do you feel about having them on the books? And then if we don't need it, we don't do it. So the, the, the challenge I have is I also have uh, work-related evening meetings. And um, it's difficult for me to keep, you know, a lot of Mondays and Tuesdays available because I can't have Friday work meetings. So then it, it, it cuts the, uh, it, it, it's, it severely impacts my job. So I guess I don't have to come to all the meetings, which well, is, is the answer. Right. I mean, we can work within quorum uh, just in the same way we don't all vote yes on everything. I mean, sometimes some of us can't be there. So I just want to make sure you'd be okay with us moving forward on option three. And we can cancel a joint meeting if we need to. So <clears throat> later later in the agenda, we're going to be talking about the, the governance subcommittee, whether it will continue. And I'm not, I don't know. You know, how does that play into it? Where, how does that play into it, right? Because if, if all the work's going to be done in joint meetings, then do we need that governing yes. subcommittee still? Or what, what, where's that discussion right. going to go? Um, I mean, there was, there was some insist, you know, some comment previously that, that it was felt that things would move along quicker with the subcommittee doing the work. So why, does, why, do we have, why do we have the concern that we have that much workload related to that coming into this meeting? It's like, but we don't. We're not there yet. A lot of the discussion at the joint board meetings won't be necessarily just about governance, but it's about uh, alignment of, of policies and, and other other things that we would do, even if we're not going forward with, say, a, a merger. Um, and I don't. Option three works for you, and I know you have been alter, alternating shifts. Um, yeah. But I think it's important to get them on the books and, and, and not use it. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, last year we talked about uh, we want at least four members. You mentioned a quorum, but we, we said during the uh, joint uh, board members, did we want to make sure we had at least four members still going forward, or are we comfortable with just a quorum if one board only has three? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. <laughs> <coughs> I, I, I kind of like the idea of four members. I, I don't get, but I guess it's I kind of like the idea of four as well. Yeah. yeah. I hear what Andy's saying about his schedule and anybody else here, their schedule. Um, right now, we're the trustees. There's one person who's going to be a new trustee coming up right in our next. Um, anyways, and we have an opening that we're going to have to fill for Elaine's seat on the board as well. So we're going to have two new trustees. We don't know what their work skills are going to be like. So to start getting into that and saying, well, this doesn't work for me, this doesn't work for me, we could play this oh. to, for eternity because if some, one of you doesn't get reelected or somebody else, this board is constantly it's dynamic. It's going to change. I don't get hung up on whether everybody's there or not. The wheels of, of, of government will come to a halt. And we, Lori talks about how long it's taken. We're going to play this game that we got to get a quorum. We have more than a quorum. We're not going to get anywhere. 
Let's get this rolling. Okay. okay if, could I ask the, the two boards indulgence because one of the new trustees is sitting in the audience tonight and he had his hand raised a little while ago, so I'm going to ask him what he had to say. Did, did, did he want to weigh in on this? Two things. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. And had Evan said what he said earlier prior to this election, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, <laughs> all I was going to say was, can we try to schedule joint meetings no later than 7? With everything that's been described and how long these meetings can go, 7.30 turns into quarter of 8 before the first meeting's done, maybe oh, 8, then you've got I 2 or 3 hours. For this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> There's some false advertising going on here. <laughs> no, it's just a, just a thought. Yeah, but, uh, but obviously, with the, there are a lot of issues with scheduling. Do you want to vote? Okay. So, select board, everyone's good? Matt? Yeah, you want a motion? I would take a motion. Okay. Before you, motion. Yes. Another option, I know half an hour is, can be tight. No, Raj just said he started at 7 o'clock. Um, we could start with 45 minutes with this first meeting, then the joint one an hour. I, yeah. Sorry to complicate things, but right. just want to throw that out there. I think we just need to be aware and flexible regarding what's on our agendas. And I'm sure the staff will, if there's, you know, if it's just a short trustee meeting before a joint meeting, that that, that venue is going to be a little light. And we'll do the best we can. All right, Matt? So are we talking about starting at 7.45 then for the joint board meeting? No, no, no. Greg was just saying that um, it could happen that business takes us and we go over. Just a warning that that might happen. So I, I would move that, never that, that the select board approve option three for the meeting schedule for 2019 through 2020. And a second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. You didn't ask for opposed. Both. Opposed? Nay. <laughs> Nay. Oh, sorry. Abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Four to one. That vote passed. Okay. I'll ask uh, the trustees for a motion. I'll move the trustees approve option three for the meeting schedule for 2019-2020. Second. Yeah, the seconds. Uh, any further discussion from the trustees? Um, I'm, I, I will say I'd like to just emphasize to staff, because just because you got a bigger bucket, you don't have to fill it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep putting the same volume in the bucket, all right? Does that <laughs> metaphor work for you? All right, thanks, because I think we need to be sensitive that we have uh, uh, people that, yeah, we want to try to really limit uh, that. Uh, so I just make that, that, that point. So uh, trustees, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I'm abstaining. You're abstaining? Okay. <laughs> I impose your schedule on everyone else, Lori. Right. <laughs> I want number two. <laughs> right, Max, or George, I'm going to let you take on five Okay. Seven. Could I just, sorry, should mention this earlier, draw your attention to one thing the select board had um, looked at trying to find a different meeting date for the 2nd October. Yes. There's some conflicts. Um, I put that in there as October 28th, and the trustees being October 29th, so it's a different popular sc normal schedule for both of you. Evan and I won't be here, so that's why I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Thanks. I'm hoping that's something we can address more particularly when we get closer to that, or are you looking for some resolution tonight on that? I would pencil it in. If it's going to change. Yeah. Or Sarah has to do the meetings by herself, which is okay by us. I think that'd be great. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> okay. We, we have faith in her. So I'm going to get on to our discussion uh, that, uh, of a governance, the report from the governance subcommittee. And uh, the attorney, uh, uh, Dan Richardson, is with us tonight. And. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you want to join us up here. Let me see. I'm giving him my spot. Yeah, you're going to give me a yep. and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give uh, a kind of, now, I, uh, 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 I apologize, maybe a little bit of a long-winded explanation of where we are. Uh, and then when I'm done, I will uh, throw it open to questions, but also perhaps ask Dan to comment and then uh, have questions for, uh, for me or the other subcommittee members. And I also want to recognize that Irene Renner, who was on the governance subcommittee, is in the audience. So um, you might have some questions for her as well. Um, but I'd like to get through this. I'll, I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. 
Um, and so I will start by saying, and can everyone hear me all right? Everyone good? Okay. So I think we went from, uh, the governance subcommittee went from, I think we had 10 or 12 different models, and I would say that we are recommending one model. Um, and I would say the model that we're recommending is, is a unified charter model. Uh, basically, the idea is that we would continue the council manager form of government, but there would be a single unified board, um, one budget, uh, one charter, uh, one tax rate, uh, and so forth. Um, I can get into more of a discussion uh, of that if you want, but I think the concept, if we just imagine Essex Town, if Essex Junction didn't exist, and if Essex Town was like Colchester or Williston, that's pretty much the concept, um, that, that the, the general concept of a unified charter model. However, going from where we are now to, to that model, um, presents some problems and I think and, and some issues and some challenges and so um, the the governance subcommittee recognized that some of these challenges may or may not be significant it'll be up to the ten of us to decide whether they're significant ultimately um, but what do I mean by challenges well there are challenges of representation um, currently we have two two different uh, municipal corporations and people in the village may identify with one corporation one um, uh, the, they identify with Essex Junction, people outside the village may identify with others, another, the, the town, um, and so there's an issue of representation, issues of identity, and so forth, but I think the biggest issue that we um, uh, struggled with and have to potentially consider is tax equity. Um, right now, and, and I'm going to, I'll get back to the main point, but let me digress for a moment. Um, a month ago, um, the town, uh, the select board asked town voters at annual meeting to approve an approximately three and a half percent. I'm, I'm going to round off numbers and, and abbreviate things here, but I think it was about a three and a half percent budget increase at annual meeting, um, and it was approved. Um, last week, the village asked uh, village voters to approve a 4.1 percent uh, budget increase. Um, those are pretty typical numbers. I think if you went back over the last 10 or 20 years and looked at the average uh, budget increase that the town or the, vill the village asks um, voters to approve each year, it's generally around the rate of inflation, maybe give or take a little bit higher. I know that a few years ago when we moved the Essex Junction Public Works budget into the town budget, um, it brought it up to a 7.1 percent. I think it was around a 7.1 percent um, increase that year, the town uh, general fund. And we were kind of sweating that out, um, whether that was going to be acceptable to voters, but Max did a great job uh, at annual meeting explaining. We had a good dialogue with people. People got to ask questions, and so it was approved um, by a pretty significant majority. So right now, if we moved um, the village budget, the Essex Junction budget, into the town general fund budget, we would be asking voters to approve something like a 27 or 28 percent uh, increase uh, in the town general fund, okay? Typically, rate of inflation, three or four percent, an unusual circumstance, seven, maybe eight percent. I've gone to most of the annual meetings for the last two decades. I've never seen it get to 10 percent. We'd be asking for a tw about a 27 or 28 percent increase, okay? A few years ago when we bonded for the police department, we took out, I think it was an $8 million bond. I can't remember how much it was. Why didn't we just, why didn't the town just add $8 million to the general fund budget that year? Well, there's lots of reasons that communities bond, but the big reason is, is that it would have, one of the main reasons is it would have raised everyone's taxes, uh, you know, by five or $600. Um, it would have paid off the debt. You wouldn't have had the interest to pay off, but there's a reason why governments don't just bump up their general funds by 20, 30, 40 percent, and one of them is because voters don't like that. So if we are serious about consolidation and we're serious about doing something like unified charter model number one, um, I think that I, we kind of feel that we have to maybe think about what's going to happen when we try to unify the two budgets. So we could take the attitude, it doesn't matter. Um, our job uh, as the two boards, as the governance committee and the, and the trustees and select board, our job is just to figure out what's the ideal form of government, 
we put it out there on a ballot um, and let the chips fall where they may, bite the bullet, rip the Band-Aid off, whatever the metaphor you want to use, see what happens. Historically, what's happened in the past is that the, the, uh, it sets up a town versus village uh, di uh, an antagonism, and it has been um, defeated every single time. Uh, I can't say it's always just because of the uh, sudden increase in taxes in the town outside the village, but I suspect that it was that played a significant piece. So if we feel that we need to address this, um, and perhaps we don't, perhaps that'll be the decision of the board that we don't have to worry about this. But if we feel that we have to come to terms with this, there are some ways that, there are a number of ways that we can uh, deal with it. And I think we've had some dialogue with Dan and we've had dialogue, dialogue with staff. One of the ways that we could deal with it um, is to have a vote that says four years from now, five years from now, we're going to have a unified charter. We're going to agree to a new, a new unified charter, a unified board, a new electoral process. But between now and then, every year, um, we're, we're going to maintain the status quo. The trustees will still uh, develop the budgets for village services. Uh, we'll still write policy for village services. But just as we did with the Public Works Department, we will move the budgets for those individual village departments into the town general fund. So we will gradually ratchet up over the course of four or five years the town general fund while reducing the village's general fund. And then at the end of four years, when all of the costs have been equalized and there's just basically just one unified tax rate, then we would move over to the unified charter model. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, another possibility is to, and, and by the way, let me digress a little bit. In, in that unified charter model, we could also include a provision that says when we go to the new charter, um, we stop calling it the the incorporated village of Essex Junction becomes the unincorporated village of Essex Junction. It remains the village of Essex Junction. The signs still say Essex Junction. Public works trucks still have Essex Junction. Um, and there's still a village of Essex Junction. Um, and that, that gets us away from the whole struggle over what are we going to call the new thing. It, we continue calling everything what we're calling now, the town of Essex. And there's the village of Essex Junction. So that's, that's one concept. Another concept would be to declare that the village of Essex Junction is, we, we go to a unified charter model, but the village is now a special taxing district in the sense that it has a higher tax rate than the remainder of the town outside the village. And it just pays more taxes, but that tax rate gets decreased every year, while the town budget gets increased every year. So over a period of four or five years, you kind of phase in um, the tax increase the way that we did the way that IBM did with the village in the town where they just reduced the machinery and equipment tax over a number of years so that would be one use of a special district that's not really a governance model that's a kind of a finance scheme um, but those two schemes that I just mentioned they both entail a significant tax increase for homeowners property owners outside the village it, it, it phases it in, it, it, it buffers it, it maybe eases the pain, and maybe that's the way to go. Um, but if we think that we really need to permanently address the problem, that we really don't, we really need to maintain some kind of a, a, a difference, uh, then we could have a unified charter model, but we have a special, say, recreation and library district in the village, a special library and recreation district in the town, and everybody pays a unified tax rate for essential services. There's still a unified board, just as we laid out with the unified charter model. But there would also be two special districts, one in the village, perhaps one in the town. And each would, there would be separate budgets for just those specific services, recreation and library. That if you did that, then that would ease some of the tax shock of equalizing taxes, and it would also give people and uh, voters in the village and voters in the town, perhaps a little bit of a sense of control, maybe a little more sense of identity over their sp specific services. Um, and there are variations on how you could, so that would require two special districts. And there are variations on how you could do that. So then the question is, who sets the budget and for those, those, those special districts, those the library and recreation? You might need to have, one way to do it would be to have a 
perhaps an elected and appointed board or an elected board in each of the special districts that sets the budget for just for those special services. Sort of the way we have a, uh, the, the Brownell Library Board works right now. Um, we have a elected people who, people who run for the Brownell Board. They recommend a budget to the village trustees. They don't have taxing authority. We can reject their budget. We don't have to accept their budget, um, but we, we uh, historically have accepted their budget, and we just incorporate it into the village budget. And so the concept would be kind of the same. And so that's the reason I, I, we're bringing this up. And we're not advocating for any one of these things. We're just sort of mentioning what we've been talking about. Um, so the, the reason, therefore, we said special district model, I, I put this here as kind of a catch-all, a placeholder for a bunch of different possible concepts, potentially using special district, potentially requiring a slightly different or an uh, uh, additional layer of government, government um, than the unified charter model. So that's why that model is here. Um, lastly, uh, we have, I, we put status quo. We're not recommending um, that we put status quo on the ballot in 2020, um, but we are recommending that we need to probably define and really come up with a good explanation and description of what status quo is because we, over the last six or seven years, we've moved away from uh, the traditional incorporated village and incorporated town. We have shared administration, shared public works. We may be sharing some other things. Uh, so we probably want to define that. And as we do public outreach, uh, give people a very clear understanding of where we are. Because if, they, if voters reject our charter change proposal in 2020, in effect, what they're voting for is the status quo. So they should understand what it is they're voting for. Um, Additionally, as we do outreach, we probably want to give uh, people in the village and the town uh, sort of a baseline, uh, a, a model to compare what we're asking for to the way we are right now. Um, sorry for being long-winded. I'm going to get to the electoral process. Very briefly, um, what we thought was that we probably want to have uh, two electoral districts. I think we, we called them voting, voting districts, but it, voting districts is a little misleading. In a sense, we have voting districts now, whereas people in the village vote in town elections at the high school, and people in the town outside the village vote at the middle school. But we're all voting for the same ballot. Uh, what we're really saying is that we would have two separate representation districts so that there would be, so that the representatives to the new uh, unified board, um, you would have a two or three or maybe four coming from the former uh, village and the same number coming from the former town. Um, and people in those two separate districts would only vote for those representatives. Um, so that's one concept. The other concept, of course, is the way we do it now um, for the select board, where you have just at-large voting. Anyone, anyone from within the borders of the town can run for the select board. So we, we, those are the two models that we came up with. We're kind of, we, saw, we kind of thought that the first one maybe answers a lot of questions. It addresses a lot of concerns. Perhaps people uh, in the town outside the village would be OK with a pretty significant tax increase if they had the assurance that they were going to, uh, that, that they were going to maintain, always be uh, guaranteed a certain number of representatives on the new board. We don't know. That's a matter for discussion. Um, the, one of the drawbacks, however, of having, a, having two representative districts obviously with equal numbers, is that you wind up with an equal number of people on your elected board. And that can be a problem when you need to have someone break a tie. Um, one way around that would be to have perhaps two and two, and then one person running at large in the whole community. That's one way of doing it. However, that person has to get elected from the entire community, while all the other board members only have to run a political campaign within the two districts. So it's a bit of a disadvantage. Um, and you're asking someone to do a lot more work, and unless they have some additional authority or power, um, it's problematic. But again, something for discussion. Uh, the next piece, we just rank these, um, and uh, we looked at the, we had some previously, and I think all 10 of us, well, I'm sorry, we new members didn't help, but um, the, the boards looked at, came up with some ideas from previous joint meeting discussions about 
what do we want, what do we look for, what are the values that we apply to ranking and considering uh, new governance models, and uh, the, the governance subcommittee fine-tuned these, and then we ranked the different concepts, special district versus unified charter versus status quo and electoral process, and the, the rankings speak for themselves. Um, we just thought that that would be helpful looking at this. So in terms of next steps, um, what we're recommending is this. What I presented you with are a lot of, we have a lot of questions. We're saying that if we want to put something on a ballot in November 2020, then we have to have a pretty clear idea of where we want to go by the end of this calendar year. Because we think it, you want to take, we want to take advantage of the uh, annual meeting cycle next March and next April. So in, in order to do that, in order to get things ready for, the next, for our next annual meeting cycle, we really want to have, th have a clear direction by the end of this calendar year. Uh, so that's our recommendation from the subcommittee. And so how do we do that? How do we answer all the questions that we're going to have and get feedback that can give us a pretty good sense of what, how we want to fine tune uh, the governance model? How, for example, do we decide whether the tax equity issue is going to be a deal breaker for people outside the village? How do we decide whether maintaining village identity is a deal breaker for people in the village? How do we get some feedback on those kinds of questions? Uh, so what we're recommending is we want to do an outreach campaign. We're recommending we start that as soon as possible. Um, we're recommending that we hire uh, a consultant, someone who can run uh, the, and, and work with us and coordinate an outreach campaign. Um, it has been recommended that we do community forums. That's great. Um, community forums are great. But keep in mind, in November 2020, there are literally, it's a presidential election, we specifically chose that date because we anticipate that there will be thousands, hopefully thousands of people coming to the polls in Essex and Essex Junction. Uh, and so we need to be able to reach thousands of people. We need an outreach effort that goes beyond previous outreach efforts. When we've looked at community forums, and they're terrific, but like the community forum we had last March, I think we had 26 people. I think when we did community forums for the Recreation Governance Group, um, they went to middle schools and, and I think they typically had audiences of 25 or 30 or 40 people. Um, when we look at Heart and Soul, we had, I think, 400, 500 people. How do we reach thousands of people? How do you really go out there and get to the people who don't look at Front Porch Forum, don't go to community forums, don't look at the town and village website, maybe occasionally read the Essex Reporter, but they really aren't engaged with local government, but they're going to be coming to the polls in 2020 voting for the president, and they're going to be handed a ballot saying, what do you, do you, what favor, what, do you favor this charter proposal? They're going to ask, what is it about? Why should I vote for this? And so we need to be able to reach them ahead of time and very clearly get some sense of what's on their mind and how they're going to vote so that we can kind of uh, maybe custom and, and in, inform uh, the, the proposal that we put in front of them. So what we're recommending is that as soon as possible, we hire a, a, an outreach strategist. And between June and September, approximately, um, maybe a little bit longer, we conduct the outreach campaign. And then in October, November, the joint boards will take that information and we will hopefully have a little bit more clarity about exactly where we want to go in terms of the, the, the charter proposal we want to put in front of the voters. It will still require some fine tuning, perhaps. We'll still want to do some more community outreach, but hopefully why not take um, advantage and take the time to reach out and talk to people, talk to people, particularly, and I'm going to be very blunt here, folks in the village are a little bit more politically active, we found. I think if you look back over the, the history of community forums and so forth, folks in the village tend to get a little bit more involved. It, it is dark. I think it's perfectly related to geography. Folks out in the, uh, in the town, harder to reach and tend to be less engaged. We, want to, we need to engage them. We need to get them involved. We need to understand what they're thinking. 
So um, hopefully we will have input from significant input from all corners of the community. Um, and then we can really um, fine tune the governance option that we want to put in front of the voters next year. Uh, and so with that, I'll wrap it up. I know you're going to have a lot of questions for me, um, but I would like to, if I could just take a moment, I'm going to switch over to Dan and ask Dan if he has any uh, comments and commentary on what I've just said, because he may have some additional thoughts. And then I would also, uh, if it's okay with Elaine, invite everybody to also ask Dan. We have some new members here um, so who may have some additional questions for Dan. Uh, we've had the luxury of being able to talk to an expert in municipal law. Some of you haven't, so with that, I'll throw it over to Dan. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, yeah. Are we okay? Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, the only thing I guess I would add is that, uh, you know, there are ways to handle each of the issues that George raised under and still maintaining a unified town model. Um, that none of the challenges that he's put out there are insurmountable or there's only one square peg that's going to fit that hole and if it's not a square peg then all is lost. I think there's a lot of different options as we've I've gone over with, with various of you that I do recognize um, you know some of the different options that are available. Uh, one town that I was actually looking at earlier today uh, is the town of Bradford that in 2004 merged the village in the town. Um, and they did a lot of very good creative um, things because of the same type of issues that are driving the things here. The only thing I guess I would add on top of it is that, you know, one thing that when you're saying to a, a town person outside of the village that you're going to be paying more taxes, the question always be, all, I always get it, are, well, what are the benefits? Um, and I think that has to just be made clear, is that, you know, there are benefits that would attach, and, and if they don't, so say you have something fixed like sewer and water that just can't go to the far reaches um, because of the limitations of physics or resources, um, you know, that, uh, that can be set aside in a special district. George alluded to that, and I, we've talked about this before, but you know, the, the special districts is really the way uh, that a lot of municipalities are dealing with these type of issues as they arise where there are differences between uh, various areas, and how do you isolate those benefits and costs that are only, so that only those who receive it bear the costs of it. Um, and so there's a number of those things that are are available, um, and I, you know, I welcome any questions you have. Um, actually, Dan, before we open it up to questions, I just want to add just a couple sure. thoughts to what George's report was. I was also on the subcommittee, and um, there is a couple variations that I didn't hear George add that I just want to put out there with a unified charter model. Another option, George had suggested, you know, in five years after we piecemeal move each department into a single budget, voters could want to choose to merge the governance first and then work on a taxation plan. And it's possible that we could work out, um, I believe this is what was attempted in the last merger process, uh, a, a gradual over time amortization of tax increases so that it doesn't happen 25 28 percent at once but it could happen three 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 and three however th however that might work so that's also an option another possibility with the special district as Dan was just saying um, a special district of just the village services that just village residents pay for rec and library pretty much that could be the same we could establish a special district and then just the village that uses those district services would pay for them, which would also protect the town outside the village from tax increases. So there's there's a lot of variety within the unified charter model that we could work on, and that's what we're going to come to you to talk about in the public over the next couple months so that we can determine what it is you're, you're interested in having happen. And the other thing that we haven't talked about the workload that we have to figure this out over time is su substantial. And one of the things we're going to have to spend a lot of time on is taxation. How is it going to work? 
moving all of these departments together. You know, how are we going to, so our, our public works departments are funded different ways. Our capital budgets are funded different ways. We're going to have to blend them and figure out how the financing is going to continue without negatively impacting one half of the town or the other. And so one aspect of that we haven't even talked about yet is utilities. And town outside the village residents have a significantly higher water bill than village residents. So if we are able to work that out too, the tax increases may end up being a wash. You know, so we really have to look at all it's, of this It's $453 stuff. is what the average average household spends outside the village. Okay, and so it's, it's about two. More. So it's 400 and some dollars yeah. more that, uh, if you're on water, both water and sewer. Right. That's it, yeah. And so when we have that conversation. It costs me 70% more to take a shower than it. <laughs> you have less hair. <laughs> so my point is, there is still a lot of very important conversation to be had regarding these finer details. And so we're going we're to want to hear from folks, but we also have a lot of work to do. Um, and the other thing I just want to bring up, I'm hearing from a variety of residents very, very recently, you know, George was talking about electoral districts and how we were talking about two districts. We're not limited to two districts. We're also not limited to town and village. We could do it the other way and have a bunch of districts that have town and village. So we need to be very creative, and I don't want to limit us to just certain, you know, preconceived notions and anything that might perpetuate the divide that we're trying to get away from. So I just wanted to add those comments. So thank you. So now, anybody who has questions for Dan? And the only thing I, I, I think you back that actually one of the notes I've made is that if. You do create voting districts. I would certainly recommend you create it with the ability to rewrite those districts over time, because one thing that happens is population shifts. Sure. Right. So a district today that may be equitable tomorrow isn't, um, either because a bunch of people move into it, and so it needs more representation, or a bunch of people move out, in which case it should decrease. Yeah. And so the it has to be population based by the constitution. Exactly. An independent uh, committee, perhaps, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> two questions, and I guess one comment is that if you take away people's busing, I guarantee you get hundreds of people coming to a meeting. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, got that in. you know, right? I mean, it's, it's a thought for us. You know, <laughs> I've been being on the recipient end of 250 or so people. Uh, you know. Uh, Maybe not the best of moods, but still. Um, the the questions that I had, um, the the combination option presented here with one at large individual, which is what the select board members are doing now anyway. So I don't really necessarily see that as a dramatic a burden on anyone. But uh, there's nothing in statute, nothing that says we can't do that. Have two members from one ward or district or whatever we're going to call it, two from another, and then one single at-large person. I just, I don't think I've heard of that anywhere in Vermont before, but I don't know, if, if it's all kosher, then I just want to get clarification. Sure. Um, this goes to the, so in statute, the, uh, the statutory general guidelines talk about select boards. They talk about at-large membership. Um, but one thing you would be doing is by creating a charter, you can create the proportional uh, representation that would have a mixture of either, you know, most most cities in, in Vermont, well, I mean, look at Burlington. They've created both sort of micro districts and then sort of larger districts so that, um, and they change that over time. Um, but the charter allows you that flexibility to make those changes. So as long as you put it into the charter and the charter's approved, it's kosher. And then uh, the second question I have, and this is also maybe just for the board members as well, but would this be a really good time for us to consider looking at the annual meeting model and incorporating that into the new unified charter? Because the, 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 the feeling that I'm getting in from individuals, you know, presidents of the community I talk to is the difficulty that we have in having such a small voting population actually able to make it to the annual meeting, um, which I think is just becoming more and more, you know, potentially burdensome. You know, we, we have real 
difficulties with parents who can't necessarily leave their kids alone, making it to the one opportunity they have to have a say. Well, two opportunities they say to have uh, you know a say in the budget itself. So uh, I would like to include in any discussions that we have, certainly looking at how we could potentially streamline the annual meeting or maybe make it informational rather than uh, a voting model. I mean, I just, I'm not sure how that would work yet, but I, I want to make sure that's included within these discussions. That's an excellent question. I'd like to um, answer that in more detail. Um, so you might recall the Essex Governance Group, which was a group of folks from four years ago, I think, at this point. And um, they got together and talked about how how we should do voting in the future. And then we sort of, they had a report and the boards accepted it and now we're here. So, so now we can bring that report out and dust it off. Um, one of the criteria that we used on the subcommittee to determine which governance models would be best was does it make voting easier? And in that context, you know, village residents have to vote five times, town residents vote three times. So you know, does it lower the number of times that you have to vote? And that's one of the ranking requirements that we had. Um, and then in terms of making accessibility better for parents, people who work second shift, all that kind of thing is also important. Um, I'm sure that how we elect these people is going to also have to be a question we ask everybody. Because there's a lot of people who would like to change everything over to just Australian ballot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to be said for that because we are a town of over 21,000 people. And as research has shown, town meeting is not the most viable option for us. However, it'd be a darn shame to let it go. Right. So we, the Essex Governance Group came up with a hybrid model, which I'm not going to spend time on right now, but it will come up in conversation. And we can also consider the possibility of representative town meeting, which is what Brattleboro does, which I think is a model that's pretty neat, and I would love to explore it in more detail. So we're going to have that conversation. and. One of the goals of this whole process will be make it easier for everyone to vote. Great. Thank you. Okay. Sure, you want me to talk? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, just because you just said that about three times and five times voting, I I, I really need to understand where what where, where, where those numbers come from. I assume it's. Town meeting, town the meeting. actual the annual meeting, the town day after, which is the voting. Then village. there's this. Then there's the uh, village meeting. The village meeting. Village annual. Village annual, which was today, right? Right. I voted today. And the school. It's school. 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 It's the same vote, and right? In November. Though. Yeah. So the I vote. School, school board annual, school annual meeting is different from. Yeah, but you don't vote there. We no, do. but right. So yeah. it's village. I mean, there are some articles. Really? It's yeah. town annual, it's annual meeting. Budget town elections. But I'm also invited to that one too, right? Because it's the same school district now. So I only vote one less time. I, I keep hearing that it's three times in the town and five times in the village, but it's only one different. The only one I don't vote at is your the village annual meeting. Just just to be clear, I think there's okay. been some. I I've heard that for years, that it's three and five, but. I'm including the November general election. Yeah, I vote now. then too, yeah. Right. Okay, so. The only time I don't vote is the village annual meeting. That you don't vote, so that, that's where I'm. It's only one different. That's that's. I just want to clarify that. I appreciate your <laughs> attention to detail on that, but I think we can all agree that we vote too many times. I, I, mean, vote, I vote as many times as I can, and I'm proud of it. So <laughs> yeah. that's, that's okay. a different way of looking at it. Yes, but we we want to make it more convenient and less frequent. So can I continue? Absolutely. All right. Okay, so um, so it sounds like it's a given that the village isn't willing to give anything up. Uh, what do you mean? Well, you, you're, you're talking about taking the village budget and putting it lock, stock, and barrel into the town. Okay. So I haven't heard, and I don't know if, if this outreach that we're planning to do will include questions like, if you live in the village, are there any services, or, or the town, are there any services that you would be willing to give up? And I think that's a. I think it's a fair question to ask. And I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on anybody or poke anybody in the eye. No, but I just want to say. But I want to interrupt you, know, you because I. I believe I could be wrong, but I believe when we started when we started all this, we said that that was one of the that was one of the criteria by which we would proceed. That there would we would not look at any model that said, 
okay, we're great, but we're going to shut down the SS Free Library. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Mm -hmm. It was if the concept was to take all existing municipal services and not eliminate anything. So that's why I wouldn't even go there. That, that, that I don't think is true. We had Stop. this we had this discussion over in Lincoln Hall, and when we had the discussion about definitions. And one of the definitions that I brought up that I made sure we talked about was we, we talked about quality of services, which I said, this is a different thing than actual services. And I wanted to make it clear, and everybody nodded their heads and said, yes, you're right. That means this means we're going to maintain the quality of services. It doesn't mean we're going to do everything that we do in both organizations in perpetuity just because we've always done them. And so I, I, I think it's a very valid question to go to these outreach things and say, you know, this is what the impact is. You know, this is, these are the things that are, are, are things that could get in our way are the costs and the fact that costs are shifting. Is there any way that you can imagine that any spending could be reduced on either side? And I think it's a valid and fair question to ask. So can and I, can I, and I understand there could, be, there could be a lot of resentment around that, but... Can I get clarification, Andy? Yep. So when you started this conversation, you said, would there be any services the village would be willing to give up? Then I just heard you say on either side. So yeah, that's true. Would be no, my my apologies. I, 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 I probably phrased that initial question. That's so statement. The question would be to both communities. Yes, I, I would. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yes. Oh, yeah. Please. Um, the uh, question of having a special tax district which I think is different than a voting district, because voting districts have to be proportional. You have to have, and then they just happen to be at this point fairly, they have to be within 10% or something like that of each other, but they could shift. And so that, that the, the question is your, your voting district, your representative, sorry, your representative district, if you're gonna have a representative district, doesn't necessarily overlap with your tax district. The challenge there, though, I think, is that if you have a tax district and uh, it has a different tax rate than another part of the town, you're likely going to want those people that are in that tax district to be the only ones to vote on that portion of the budget. Yes. And so you may end up with multiple weird tax or, or voting districts, one for representation and one for taxing. I, I don't know how you're going to work that. And that, I think it's a, that's a question we didn't need to, right. and, to work and, through. And, and thus my point of saying that the, the it was sort of a catch-all. I couldn't really define it because there's so much, there are so many potential ways of playing it in the special using a special district model that I couldn't really say. Well, here's specifically and exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it back. I'll give it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make it even more clear. Got so much more to say. <laughs> All right. um, Andy, is it possible for you to bring with your questions and allow someone else to ask and we can come back? Would that be all right? Who would like to ask questions next? Do you have questions, Andy? Andy? <clears throat> so, I didn't bring these as props, but I used to live on Sand Hill Road in the town outside the village, and now I live in the village of Essex Junction. Both times I'm a resident of the town, except sometimes I'm only a resident of the village, and it gets complicated, right, in ways I don't think it should get. So my feeling is, if we're going to become, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, if we're going to become one thing, I think it's really important that we become something that removes the town outside the village and the village feeling so that whether I lived on Sand Hill Road or closer to Five Corners, I, I feel as though we're all in the same place. And so there's great value to designing this to be that when we vote there's somehow a, a brand new way that we're all looking at what this is. Can we, Dan? Yes. I'm like desperately, here. I'm like, I know his name, I know his name. Can we do that? Can we be one thing 
and have a new way of dividing, not dividing, sorry, I said it's a really terrible word, a new way of forming ourselves so that when we vote, it completely blasts out this whole town outside the village, village, can we fix it so that we can joyously be one, so that I'm, so that myself and someone that lives further up, instead of feeling animosity, I can say, hey, you know, what do you, I want to vote for, what about, like, I want to be on board with someone. How do we do that? Can you fix that all right now? Um, no, I can't. Um, but I, yes, you can, I mean, I think one of the proposals on the table would be, you know, to essentially start from scratch, create a new entity, rather than taking the town charter and pasting in village or vice versa, um, create a new charter, create a new entity that would represent sort of a merger of the two um, and, and start with that. And I think that's the idea of proportional representation could be both a good and bad thing. Uh, I think, you know, one of the fears that you're expressing would be that it would entrench that separateness, that otherness, yeah. that you had your village, you know, essentially be this board, you know, formalized as a single body where you had the trustees and you had the select board members. Um, so in some ways, you know, that what you could do is to make sure that you, um, you know, you created voting districts that, that broke at that merger, um, you know, that created these new, that, that, you know, for certain reasons might be more aligned. You know, there might be sections of what was traditionally the village that's more aligned with other sections of the town outside the village. And, you know, you would create that new district to do that. And then you can always have, I think, you know, the, one of the concerns that we had talked about before and that may be driving the proportion of representation is that you don't create a single voting block that votes everybody. So that if you win, you know, this neighborhood, because it has so many people in it, you're guaranteed a select seat on a, a select board. And we don't have to go to this corner over here because there's only six people over there and I don't, I don't care what they think. And, and it's this big block. That, that's the danger yeah, of that no. large representation. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of different ways to cut at this. And I think, you know, it's really going to be, um, that's the process that's in front of you, to, 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 to cut at these districts um, and create these voting, you know, I call them wards, just to separate it from <clears throat> using district in another sense, you know, but create these, these natural neighborhoods um, where you could have this type of representation. Um, you know, and, and going back to Patrick's earlier question, you know, there are towns in Vermont that, you know, try and balance out that, that mixture of, and that's the at-large seats. Um, they often call the person who runs for the whole city, you know, they, they do a mayoral system, even if they keep a town manager. Um, the mayor then becomes sort of the unifying person. They're also the, 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 the tiebreaker and the veto pen. And because they are elected from the entire uh, town. And you, then you might have councillors or select board members that represent various districts within the uh, voting wards within the town. I should use my own nomenclature. A, a follow up question. Um, before you spoke about um, that they would need to have space to grow and change, what would the, what would the rules of that be? I mean, it could be a number of different ways, but you can do a, a sort of reapportionment that could be every X number of years where you would revisit that. Kind of the way we do it with, on a federal level, every 10 years is a reapportionment. You could also have it as a, a trigger when uh, certain neighborhoods became, you know, a certain percentage smaller, it would trigger a reapportionment. Uh -huh. You could do both. I mean, there's really no reason not to to do that, but you could have those those type of triggers that, that um, would allow you to redo that. Thank you very much. Sure. So I, I don't have questions, but I do want to say a couple things. Yeah. Um, one, I want to thank the subcommittee, and I, I forget who was on it, but whoever was on it, I know this was a lot of work. The and and the thank you all. I know this is a lot of work um, and hard to get to a consensus, so I appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate that the recommendation 
is a new charter. I think that's really important to, as Dan said and as Andy has so nicely stated, I mean, we need to um, come in as one instead of coming in as two bodies. And so doing a new charter, I think, is great. Um, I appreciated a lot of the questions Dan posed in regards to the special district. So although it's, an, it's a it's a neat idea, and when we were talking about the, the merging of the rec departments and having a special cultural district, it could be a really cool thing for the village, but I think the intent for that was something different than maybe the intent of this, which would be to kind of keep the tax equity not such a problem. So I would just really say we should really look at those questions and make sure we're honestly answering them. And then lastly, I will just say I'm really excited to be on the audience <laughs> for this next conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dan. Uh, just a couple of the things that run through my head. The whole idea of taxation, equity, or whatever, you know, throughout the whole community would be nice. I think, it, like you, you started, George, it'll be difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to swallow in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I just don't want to see taxation without representation within our community. That's the biggest issue that it comes down to. I'm being taxed, but the people that are, are, are governing my, you know, this, what I'm paying for, don't have to pay that tax. That doesn't sound right to anybody in this room, hopefully. I mean, that's not the way it should be. Um, and how you get over that, I don't know, it's not an easy thing to do. As far as the hard feelings, and I mean, I love the village and everything, and I, there's some people that are very passionate about it, but I think as time goes on, things have changed. I mean, if you look back, you go back, what, um, Vermont before 1791, we weren't a state. I mean, it was, we were part of New York or New Hampshire, you know, it's different opinions. I'm sure everything, change in history, everything's going to change. In 50 years, I'm sure things are going to change here, but I hope it's not going to be 50 years, but I'm just saying, it can change, and we'll get through it. Um, I, want, I think we really should go all. I don't want to see a, a, a partial change. Go for a charter change that doesn't include everything. I'd, I'd rather see it all go through, um, and not this, you know, a little bit here, and then we go back, take another bite at the apple in five years, ten years, and try and, you know, get this thing through. It, I think we need to go all for it. My, my, I'll just ask other question, but I'll just in, interject here. My, my only concern, and I just will, will emphasize this, is to be, is, is to be as objective as possible. Understand that the passions that we have, the opinions that we have, the strong feelings we have about consolidation, may be in the my, very much in the minority when we look at 16,000 voters in Essex Junction and Essex Town. And so we need to some way to get out there and take their pulse. And what we really need is probably a way that has a two-way dialogue that takes their pulse, but also maybe injects them with a little bit of our passion and a little bit of our enthusiasm. But, you know, we don't want to go sailing onto the rocks and say, we've got this beautiful thing figured out here, and yet the rest of the community isn't with us because we overlook something. So that's why... I, to get back to the issue of hiring someone who can really get out and take the pulse of the community, really take some of these questions that we're raising and concerns that we're raising here, and get out and try to get some feedback on them so that we don't go sailing in one direction and really we should have been going over here or we left something undone. That's my, that's my only comment at this point. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, Dan, one of the questions I have is can a community vote to approve a uh, interim uh, representative district, and then in the subsequent year, should that pass, then have an independent group to study what is the most equitable, most uh, fair representative model for elections, and then have that model become so similar to the reapportionment process that the state goes through uh, now. Make sure I understand the question. Is are you talking like an interim government between what you have now and what you would? seek to have or so can the voters approve on November 2020 say yes we want this to happen and as a part of this when it comes time for 2022 2021 this is how then the voting districts will look like this way we understand that for this one time we're going to approve it for this method 
uh, once the census data comes available, then we can look at where the population spread is. We can look at what is the right uh, numerically proportional process to have for representation in our community. Um, yes. I mean, as long as it's, you know, that would be a matter of just writing out. So if you think about how this would functionally work, what the end of this process before the vote in front of the, the town and village, the, you know, the, the, the voters, you've got to come up with a proposal, which is going to be a, a charter. And you could in, certainly incorporate that into it, as sort of interim, how, how we're going to transfer from the current system towards the eventual system. I, I, would, add, I would counsel fewer steps between what you have now and what you would eventually have, the better. <coughs> Um, but certainly if there was a need for some type of interim that could be put in and then if the voters approve the charter then it goes to the legislature they can tweak it um, as they see fit and if it's passed then it would go into place but you could yeah if you if you were clear in the charter that this is the process that we would follow um, for you know uh, apportioning the wards um, that certainly a valid way to do it. I mean, there, there, there's a different way to cut at it, and I guess what I would throw back is to say, check and see what your data looks like, um, because especially a small area like this, it's it's a fairly easy to measure, and um, I think you could do that fairly fairly easily. You wouldn't necessarily, you're not going to have a lot of, you know, it's not like the national level where they, the 10 years really does mean a big substantial change. Because you're looking at, you know, even a small shift creates seismic waves in how how districts are apportioned. Um, but then, you know, in something like this, you could have a pretty good idea by the time you start to come into 2020 what this was going to look like. Um, my last question, I think this is more for Georgie Lane. The item with the way that it's worded on the agenda is to discuss and potential selection of preferred governance options. Does this mean that tonight we need to have a motion to say these are the options that we want a I don't know, consultant to have a consultant to move forward with? And are we limiting ourselves tonight to say these are the options? There is nothing else. Well, the the, the governance subcommittee is we were strictly advisory. We're not we can't make decisions for you. All we can do is make bring information and recommendations to the two boards. And I guess what we're recommending is at this point, because there's so many issues that we still need to address, Andy still has questions, I know, um, that that all we're saying, it, the, the really, the, the key recommendation is where we'd like you, we would urge you to make a decision on tonight is to hire a, or to tell, to instruct staff to go to make some um, inquiries and go forward with an RFP um, to hire a consultant who can do the outreach for us. That would be the most important thing. So if there's something that we don't discuss tonight or say, yes, this one model that we're not discussing, this one factor that we're not talking about, this one other question that we may sit on, that's okay for today. Oh, yeah. And it will get answered at some yeah. other point in time. And that yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, okay. we're, we're, not, we're not trying. I mean, we can go down. There's 100 rabbit holes we can go down here. A different Talking about electoral process, <coughs> talking about governance structure, taxation. No, we're not going to solve any of that tonight. We're not saying... Let's try to figure it all out tonight. I just wanted to make sure that we're all that yes. Yep. In case some in case somebody misses something or we don't ask the right question, that right. We're, we're good. Yeah. Great. Oh, I'm on the subcommittee. I've asked my questions. And I'm okay. Can I ask one question? I I want to get a little bit. Uh, I and, and Dan maybe can enlighten us. And this would be more for staff. But I, I just I'm just curious. Let's say we, everything works out and we consolidate. So, like in November, we have a cons successful um, vote to create a new charter and so forth. Whatever the decision, whatever the structure is, and it's going to go off to the legislature. But what happens here locally at that point? And what I'm saying is, right now we have ma the manager is in charge of two different you know, two different governments two different bodies that are in charge of the manager and, you know, legislature, legislature. but who, who, how do you, who decides how you, what you're actually going to structure and build this new government? How does that all work and what's the process? Well, I mean, you want to lay it out in transitional, in term, transitional provisions in the charter. Okay. Um, so, you know, so a lot of this, 
I don't think will, will affect um, sort of the on-the-ground staff that are doing the day-to-day work. -day. You're, you're not talking about abandoning the, the manager model right. form of municipal government. So the manager will be here before and after the change. It's just going to be um, he'll respond to a different board after. And usually what happens when you have this type of merger is you would have provisions to say that the day this would, or the, you know, the first election after this becomes effective, the new voting districts will, you know, a new board will, will meet for an election on this date. And then, so the new board takes over. Um, but until that charter passes, the old charter continues. I see. Okay. So, and, and even, if, even after it passes the, the, the vote of the, the citizens, um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't take effect because it hasn't passed the legislature. So I know Andy has a few more questions, and there may be a couple others, and then after we have exhausted our questions, I would like to open it up to our guests in the audience because I see a lot of nodding heads and raised hands. So let's just plan on wrapping up our own questions, and then we'll go to public input, brief public input. Can I go again? Yes, yeah, where the battery now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, to... to, to uh, Dan's comments there about the, the timeline is one of the things I wanted to bring up. It sounds like you haven't stepped through it all the way to the end or, I mean, because if we have a vote in November 2020, it's unlikely that the legislature will look at, look at it until after crossover, which is after town meeting. So we've already, we've already approved a budget. We already have uh, a select board elected. Um, and then it's not really until I think, and then, and then the, 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 the earliest the new charter could take effect would be town town meeting of I, yeah I know that's that's what I don't know. that's what it, it's, yeah. so so it would be it would be vote vote in November 2020 <laughs> town meeting of 2021 you it, the new charter wouldn't be in place yet right and then you'd have a budget that would take you all the way to Ju to June 30th of 2022 so I think this new charter doesn't take effect until July. First well, of, of 2022, and parts, parts, of, it, parts of it can, and yeah. parts of it, it's you know think of when you have elections in March, the new board members are bound to the existing budget from the prior year, and they don't really take you know until they take office, they don't they're they're they don't have a say in in the budget. But but you wouldn't vote the new board that's defined by the charter because it hasn't been approved by the legislature. Right. It, but I'm, well, I guess what I'm saying is, is that you you know you might have the board take effect um, after you know in the November following the approval of the charter, or you may have a call for a special meeting, or you may wait until the following town meeting in in March. I mean, I think you have a number of different options. That that sort of a, a nuance that you can you can look to see. What I would what I guess I would counsel is that you know depending on the size of the change that you're making, that may affect when you want this to take place. I, I agree entirely that you know if this passes in tw if if they get on a ballot in November of 2020, if it passes, the legislature moves slow and government ops you know is not the speediest committee to get through on either side of the legislature and so you know if that's don't antagonize them no no i <laughs> they're delightful committees both of them. um but you know you, you're right you're probably talking about at least one more town meeting and so you know you would you would be bound by the old charter you would vote but with the understanding that it may be something that the terms would be shortened so somebody elected in march may not serve out right their his or her full term um, but you would still go through that process and then you know I think you have that flexibility as to what makes sense do you want this new board to hit the ground running beforehand and, and some of it just may simply be practical um, you know having them start earlier might be better having them wait might be better um, with the budgeting process with the other issues that, that they have to deal with um, you could certainly visit that, but that's that. That would be in the charter. Those transitional right, provisions right. that, as of the date this became effective, the new there'd be an interim board 
um, and we're going through that with a lot of school districts right now as they as they merge and have special votes and that's something you could certainly deal with. So what many of the no sorry. Oh, no. No, when many of the, the <coughs> merger plans that I've read, the trustees join the select board once it's approved by the legislature, and then at the next town meeting, everybody resigns and you, you re vote a new, a, a new board, which means then you have a new board taking over a budget that they had nothing to do with putting together, but it could be a whole new group of people. But, um, um, and with with respect to and, and yeah you know you'd have some of the people on a one one year term two year or you could decide what the terms are. Um, many towns that have five member boards will have three of them three year terms and two of them two year terms so that there's more. You're not always running against the same other board member and all that you know so it changes up. But um, I'm I, with regard to. Um, uh, select board membership or whatever the final uh, the, the, the legislative body is, I'm much more in favor of um, at-large representation uh, because I think it it uh, it t takes care of it gets rid of the the animosity, the built-in uh, polarization, and I think you also um, it does two things. You, you you have to appeal to the entire community in order to get elected. Is one thing, and then the other is there's more opportunity to serve. Because uh, if there's only uh, two seats from the village and two seats from outside the village, there's only two opportunities for anybody to. Whereas today I've got five seats I can run for. I'd only have I would have a smaller number that I can run for. And and um, <coughs> the whole question of who runs when and which can be worked out right at a different time. My, my only re quick response was, I'll just, let's do a brief poll. Everyone's, every elected official in this room who lives in the village, raise your hand. Every elected official in this room who lives outside the village, raise your hand. So. Wait, one, one more question. But, well, my point, my point is, is that it may not be, we, we understand, yeah, yeah, we understand yeah, all the yeah, nuance, yeah, we understand yeah, the whole dialogue, yeah. but there are folks out there who say, who just look at where, where everyone's from and go, yeah, I don't. Li I yeah. I want some assurance that I'm going to have. And and is that is that a deal breaker for me? Do I understand? I understand right, completely. Right, right. Don't, don't I dis I agree with you completely yeah. that it should be. A, I believe it should be a large. But again, I urge that we be objective and understand yeah. that for a majority of people, particularly in the town outside the village, they may say, yeah, that's a deal breaker. For me. And and there was there was a period of two years when we had three select board members from the same neighborhood. You know, I live equidistant between Sue Cook and, right. and Irene. We were all in the same neighborhood, and I don't think anything bad happened right. um, I, as a result of that. One of the things we have to do is get over ourselves a little bit about that, because Peter Welch doesn't live next to me, but I'm pretty happy with how he's representing me. Right. It's, you know, we are a representative government, but that's a very important thing that we have to take into just, account. We just need to think about it. Just ask it. That's all I'm saying. Not, we don't have to act on it. I, I, I will yield when I'm not back. Okay. No, no, no. It was only <laughs> Keep going. In that moment. I'm sorry. Keep going. Okay. Um, just a, a comment on the report um, on the last page of the recommended steps, the last sentence of the second paragraph. Um, I hope it's not grammar related. No, it's not grammar related. I, I just, I'm just concerned about bias and we need to be careful uh, in how we word public documents. It says, this could help mitigate disinformation and misinformation efforts by opponents of town village consolidation. Mm -hmm. I think we need to also be aware that proponents of consolidation could also um, give misinformation. Give misinformation. Sure. So I think I, it, it's, an, it's an unfair okay. statement to, to say that only people who are opposed are going to have fake news associated with it. Okay. Good point. Good. Other questions? Any? I, my apologies. I just it was a momentary thing. Uh, it just for the folks playing along at home on Channel 17, to follow up with George's question, every elected official in this room who lives in the town of Essex, please raise your hand. I'm not kidding. People don't understand this. We're all residents of the town. I just really want to be clear because that kind of question can confuse those who don't understand. We are all residents of the town of Essex, and we all pay those taxes. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Evan, you had a question. Are you good? 
Uh, just, just quick, it, um, George, you brought it up earlier about the status quo not being on the ballot to maintain status quo. Right. Okay. Um, and it, it says additionally, the committee suggests consideration to given the model uh, more sustainable status quo. But anyways, in the event the proposed governance model is rejected by the voters, if you don't put status quo on the on the there is no option to keep the status quo. Then it's going to you're you're saying it's it's this or that. And there is no, you, 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 you have, you know, this type of, of, of a merge, this, there is no status quo option. So you well, can't no, you, you're right. I, I think what I was referring to, Dan, is that right now we have, uh, the, we have a shared manager, we have a unified manager in, by MOU between the two boards. Yes. There's an MOU between the two boards for our, our complex public works situation. And so the, it's come up before about, and, and, and Dan has answered this and said that MOUs are fine, but I think there's a kind of a sense of saying, do we want to build in, um, if, if let's say charter merger is defeated, do we want to build in to uh, amend the existing charter, town and village charters, as an alternative? Um, permanent commitment to this, to having a unified administration and some other unified resources. So, because right now, the MOUs will say, either board can just, we could just, you know, the next week the trustees could say, you know what, we don't like this unified manager business, we're out of here. And boom, we're out of the MOU. I mean, it would be disastrous, but technically we could do that. I think it's the same with the public, although I think there's a window of opportunity on the public works, but it's, there's a little bit of instability with these MOUs, and the idea is, while we're going forward with all the big work here, we may, in the, in the meantime, want to be thinking about how we're going to stabilize these MOUs, codify them into the charters or something like that, so that in the event of a failed uh, merger vote in 2020, um, we, don't, we don't go all the way back to where we were in 2007. Okay? That's, that's really what I was getting at. Any other board members with questions or comments? Dan, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? <laughs> well, <no>. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not done yet. Well, you st yeah, please stay at the table. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> so you have all been very patient. Can you raise your hand if you plan to speak? Okay. So I'm going to ask each of you to do two things, three things. State your name. Keep it short. And if you agree with someone who said something else, just say, I agree, okay? Because it's 9 o'clock, and I want to respect everyone's time. So please, let us know what you're thinking. Jerry. Um, maybe I'm obtuse here. Uh, when I lived, 50 years ago, when I lived in a village, I was a very urban guy. And one of the guys I worked with at GE used to milk his cows before he came to work. He was a very rural guy. And I live in the village, in a town. My neighbors are all urban people. And I don't understand why they have different needs for recreation than the village people do. So I would like to understand why the village tax rate is higher than the town tax rate. Because as far as I can tell, we all use the same recreation kinds of things. We all use the same libraries. You know, where's the difference? I don't understand that part. I think that's the basis of our entire conversation. Well, why is, it would be interesting to know why the village rate is higher. What the are the village people paying for that I in the town am not? So, the village is an incorporated village inside the town of Essex, that. and as such, village residents pay taxes to the village municipality, but they are also residents of the town. So they are paying taxes to the town okay. as well. That's why they pay more. The rate's not necessarily that different. But well, what are they getting that I'm not getting? Because I use You're the get, village library? You are, you, you are you not using services that the village uses. So Village Public Works does not come out to the town and plow the roads out there. One budget. It's one budget, but not one practice. So we are starting to slowly 
merge those services and, and you know, town public works is coming over to the village to do stuff and the village is lending their truck, their super sucker 5,000. We're, we're starting to melt, to melt that. But at the moment, just the money has moved. So village residents are paying for services that town residents don't get. But they are also paying for, for, for services that the whole town gets. So it's confusing, but that's a very succinct way of putting it. And we're trying to fix it and make it go away. That's the salient yeah, point I here. Agree with that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, can't out play village. Uh, I guess if I understood you correctly, you said that the, the the town rate would go up about twenty seven, eight percent or so. Something, my, something my, like that. My thought always was that if you merge you'd have consolidation of services the overall cost would go down. So can you tell me why they would go up by that much? Okay, let's let, let me just let's focus in on what Jerry has said, like the recreation department. Right now there are two recreation departments. There's a town recreation department, which is funded by everybody who lives in whether you're in Essex Junction or Essex Town. It's funded by everybody. Um, then there's a the village recreation department. It is only funded by people who live in the village. If you, and each one has, for the sake of argument, a $600,000 budget. I think there are more this year, but let's just say six. So you merge the two. So right now, pe pe folks in the village are paying approximately half of the town <coughs> department budget and 100% of the, of the village recreation budget. When you merge the two budgets, village, everyone now pays 50%. So folks outside the village now, their, their cost goes up people in the village, their cost for recreation goes down. Okay, so you've got rec, you've got library, what else? Uh, fire departments, um, planning and community development, and uh, those are... Consolidating fire doesn't drive the overall cost down, drives it up? I'm sorry? Consolidating fire doesn't drive the overall cost down? No, again, it's the same, it's the same dynamic. The town fire department is funded by everybody. Every at Essex Junction residents pay for the town fire department as well as folks outside the village. But only the village fire department, but the fi village fire department is funded only by people in the village. You consolidate those two the, those two budgets, the costs get redistributed. It's 50-50. Village, rate, yeah, village, village rates go down, town rates would go up. So in a, consol a completely consolidated budget, you'd say everybody, let's say the town general fund goes up on for the average homeowner by $350. Folks in the village would see that increase as well as folks in the town. However, folks in the village would see their entire village tax bill go away because their entire village tax bill now gets taken and redistributed throughout the whole community. Does, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Next. Betsy. Is Betsy? Oh, Betsy. Betsy, Betsy. <laughs> Betsy Billadu. Thank you. Um, I was just looking at your, I, I have a, a couple of points, looking at your recommended timeline and I understand the tight, tightness of it um, and maybe whoever you get for your public outreach strategist will point this out too, but it just gives me pause that much of your outreach campaign right now is scheduled for the summer when it's, it's really hard to pin, uh, I understand, but it's very hard to pin people down. Uh, often in the summer. So you had, someone had said at one point maybe extending it some. I would think maybe your, your person will say, yes, let's extend it, because I think it, that looks problematic to me. Um, the other thing that I just would mention is, um, I think it goes back to what Andrew said and a little what, what Dan said um, about um, your, your when you're looking at governance and how this is going to go and back to what Annie said. Uh, ideally, in my mind, I would, I'm on board. I'd love to see at the end the governance model is something totally different than what we, we have now. It's not just divided into the two separate sections, whether it's five, six, seven sections, whatever it is. Um, but maybe if we do look at like an amortization or a stepped program, you know, it, I believe it would be possible to say, okay, for these five years that we're stepping down, we have this model, which continues to be from these two entities, and then after five years, we move to this this other thing. As long, I believe, as long as it's in the charter. So that was just something I wanted to, mm -hmm. to throw out there. Mm -hmm. Betsy Dunn Town. 
The, um, I wonder if when you're looking at representation that you don't use the model that you use for the state, where it's for every 4,000 people you have a state representative. You could change that to every 3,000 given it's a town, but that would mean there would be like seven, because we have 21, almost 22,000 between the two. And that would make it um, equitable, and I think that there would be much more representative of the group if you had that kind of a thing. And having, I think, you know, Governor Scott said that, you know, he was very disappointed in town meeting because it's not actually doing its job any longer in some ways. And the hybrid system would, you'd still be able to have a town meeting and propose a budget and then make changes that night, the next day let people know what it is in an April vote. So I, I think that it's all doable. I think, and if you do, whether you vote in the charter change and the charter change happens and then there's a, there's a step pattern or a phasing in of the debt issues because I believe the junction has some debt as well and so that will counterbalance some of that money so that you're talking about. No? No, um, the village debt has to be paid by village residents. Okay. So it will not be transferred over to anybody else. Okay. But all good ones. So, uh, um, you know, the village folks are residents of the town, but as a longtime town resident, I have never felt that I was a village resident. So it doesn't go both ways. We've never had the option to vote or run in a village election. We've never used, been able to use, without paying extra, the, the village rec department. We've never had access to the village daycare programs. So it, it doesn't run both ways. And, and it hasn't as long as I've been here. Right. I mean, it's, it doesn't run both, way, both ways, but I think we would say, for example, anyone who walks through the door of the Brownell Library uses the Brownell Library. The village fire department, half of its calls are in the town outside the village. Um, the village recreation department is open to everybody, but people who live in the village have special sign-up privileges and get a reduction in rates. But in t the, the village as a municipal corporation is, defines a boundary within the town of Essex, and, it, and the, the policies, the taxing authority of the trustees only apply to that geographic area, whoever lives in that area that's defined as the village of Essex Junction. So, but I, I do understand, I, I think, what you're saying, Mark. Thank you. Andy. I'd like to comment on that. that you and 29 of your neighbors can start your own village. You can, <laughs> seriously, it's, it's, you, you could form another village in, within the town of Essex and have your own representation, your own budget. You can do that. It's, it's, it's allowed. It's legal. Well, Andy, the legislature would have to approve it. That's... A little caveat, though. Yeah, they may, we, they may we, not. But we can't stop them from trying to form their own. No, village. they can't. We can't the, the select board has no say in whether somebody wants to open an yeah, initiative. No, no, no. I'm just uh, you couldn't spend any money lobbying against such a <laughs> village it's outside of your purview as a municipality. But okay. Bridget, um, so here, all of this right now. I have a lot of comments and, and concerns down the road, but right now my main concern is the outreach piece of this. Um, and communication is extremely difficult in Essex. Margaret and Don, is that your name? These are intelligent people, and they don't still understand the structure. And, you know, to me, this is how do you communicate that? And I'm not the professional you're going to hire. I, I, you know, I'd, I'd throw myself out in traffic if you did that. But, uh, <laughs> but I really think that this has to be made clear. I think people come into this thinking, oh, we can communicate this, no problem. I'm going to tell you it's going to be a huge problem. And if you don't communicate it and you get to the 2020 vote, your chances are going to be pretty slim. So I don't know how to solve this problem, whether it's a hybrid um, professional community 
organization that does this or the, the professional has the community to an advisory group or whatever you want to call it, I don't care what you call it, um, that says, I need to reach those people out at, out at the end of Old Stage Road and Chapin Road and out there. How do I do that? Um, and and we might have suggestions. We, we might have suggestions. So I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure this out after having been in, I don't know how many outreach groups here. And, and not really doing the job, in my opinion. Right. So. Oh, no. Bridget, that's a huge problem. Yes. And as George said earlier, we have 16,000 registered voters we need to talk to, not the four to 500 who showed up at Heart and Soul, which is the best effort we've ever had, ever. right? Ever. ever. <laughs> so yeah, we have work to do, and, and we're going to continue the conversation. Brian, you had your hand up and haven't spoken yet, so please. Hi, my name is Brian Sheldon. I, um, good. I'm a Village native, but and, and um, just moved back here. Um, so in, tw in 2012, I um, lived in Austin, Texas, and they they had um, we had five uh, uh, at-large city council members, and they they changed to a 10-1 system with single-member districts throughout the town. And one of the reasons that they did that is everyone was kind of grumpy about a lot of things people are talking about here. You know, like all of the people were clustered around downtown. Um, so. Um, but uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention about the way they did that is the referendum that, that changed the Austin Charter um, also specified um, a, an independent citizens commission to draw the lines. Um, and uh, you couldn't, if you wanted to be on a commission, you couldn't have been a politician and you um, agreed to not be a politician for 10 years. So that there was, so the, um, the, the beauty of that is that, is that I think it worked. cuts down our volunteer <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I, frankly, we should probably do it with, um, with academics or professionals because just because, yeah, there's only 40 people here, right? Um, um, that said, I mean, I think it worked. The, the, the elections, uh, the, the, uh, the lines were considered nonpartisan by everybody. Um, more diverse candidates were elected. Um, everybody, the, the whole city was represented, if only because there were districts. It was great. Um, and also, one thing I want to point out is that the line survived challenges for the Voting Rights Act, right? So there, they, um, so, so whereas, um, speaking of these, a lot of these governance proposals that we're talking about, where you maintain the town and the village dichotomy, um, I, I agree with Annie that we should try to reduce that going forward if we're going to be unified. Um, and, and I suggest that you direct, the, you direct such a commission to um, have all of the districts be single member and straddle the village boundary. That way, everyone who's elected has to, uh, you know, has to be responsive to people on, on both sides of the town, outside the district, and the village. Um, there's a second reason why I think that's a, having the, the, the commission is a good idea, is because you can you can get away with um, drawing ta separating the town and the village right now, but I doubt you can in 2031, uh, because right now, but by my math, by the 20, 2017 census, uh, the village is 49.6 percent of the of the town. Um, but it's probably not going to be in 2031. I don't know which way it's going to go, and neither do you. So neither does anybody. So um, if you create a commission to do that, then the commission can figure that out um, as the laws change and as the population changes. And you know maybe and and hopefully what's contentious in 2031 will not be this. <laughs> All right. Anyone from the audience who hasn't spoken yet? Irene. I have several questions. The first of which is to Dan Richardson, if I may. Do you know what type of outreach was done by Bradford in order to get people to vote for their plan? I don't. Um, but I, I, will, I will say, just as a way of answering the question with something slightly different, is Montpelier just went through a very long outreach process because they're doing a lot of um, uh, building build out in the downtown and using public funds, so garage, the parking garage. And um, it was really important, I think, for those who were in favor of the garage to do this public outreach for a lot of the same things you're discussing here, which is, you know, when you talk about the status quo, it's important to let people know the status quo because not everybody understands what the status quo is. You know, so one of the points that we talked about in the subcommittee, as you remember, was the fact that you have these MOUs that are really holding together the town which are band-aids, not actual structural supports. As, as George pointed out, people can remove themselves from these. And you know, as we see on a federal level, that if you rely upon <coughs> manners and moors, um, it only takes one gate crasher to um, wreck everything. Um, you know, you can have you can have these uh, 
you want these into a, a larger structure. And so letting people know what, what exists today is a way of telling them, you know, why, why this is being proposed for tomorrow and outreaching to that, those groups. And I know um, the, city, the city and some of the private partners actually hired different groups. Um, there was a lobbyist from MMR um, who did a lot of social media outreach um, to communicate the, not only the status quo, but then the reasons why they were doing these things as a way of getting the messages out. And a lot of social media, a lot of front porch forum, it was every time you open up front porch forum, Montpelier, your computer burst into flames because it was, um, you know, it was not without controversy, but it, it required that kind of constant communication of, and, you know, everybody said, well, why don't we design this? Or why don't we do that? Which, at a certain point, you're going to come to a, an agreement of this is the way it's going to be, and that's when those people will wake up and say, well, why don't we have, you know, this, this type of, of, of option? Why don't we have, you know, a, 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 a Supreme Court of Essex instead of a select board or something like that? And, you know, which may not be a completely terrible idea, but it wouldn't be, it, it, there's probably good reasons not to, and it's a matter of keeping people focused on this is what we have, this is what's proposed. Dan, do me a favor. Explain MOU. It's an acronym. Oh, sure. Could you please explain? I, that? I will be happy. It's called, MOU is that stands for Memorandum of Understanding, which is a fancy way of saying it's a contract. <coughs> so, what holds the, the village and the town together right now are essentially a series of contracts, written documents in which each party comes to the table and says, we agree to do this. And they say, and the other party agrees as well. It's mutual promises, but there's no obligation for either party to stay within this memorandum of understanding, this contract. They can break it at any point in time. And, you know, there's really no way to force people to stay in those memorandums of understanding other than, it may, you know, public policy or it would be a bad decision to leave. It's, it's not a a binding such as a charter. There are certain things in your charter. You can't do it any other way. You can't have uh, in this, in the, you can have your town meeting in July, even if you really wanted to, um, because your your charter says, you know, March, March annual meeting uh, and town meeting day. You know, you, you're bound by it in a more legally uh, binding manner um, than the MOUs. Thank you. You're welcome. I think Irene had one more question, and then we're going to bring it back home. And we just request once again that we not use the word town loosely. I've heard it over and over tonight. It used to mean all of the 21,000 people as well as the 12,000 people outside the village. If you could just say town outside the village when you're talking about not the village, it would be extremely helpful for people who are especially new to this conversation, but also to those of us who are familiar with the conversation, because we know that the town means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Thank you. Especially the school that, one. So yes, we will do that. Uh, oh, you have another question? I, I have many questions. That's why I waited till you know till now. Okay. Um, can I ask you to limit it to five minutes because sure. it's Absolutely. Nine, almost nine thirty and we have multiple agenda items left. Certainly. And we have another question from the audience. Sure. Um, we're talking about hiring a facilitator to get public input, and I would offer that we hired a facilitator last March. We got wonderful input, and our board, at least the select board, did not spend a minute of public time going over that data, and there was lots of wonderful data there to be harvested. So I would urge you to, before we spend another taxpayer dollar, to look at the data that we've already gathered and match it up with whatever straw man we expect to bring as the model to the public the next time we're going to spend money on a facilitator and urge people to come out because people have already come out and spoken and spent an entire Saturday with us giving us excellent input and I'd like to see that input in whatever model you choose. Can I respond to that question yes. please? Mm -hmm. So we have a minute to that and we also have the report of the Essex Governance Group which is four years old and has never left our minds. So I can assure you that all of the different input that we've received over time on this subject we will consider. Thanks. The comments tonight have not shown there's that awareness among the ten people up there. So nine people. So Thanks thank you. For your opinion on that. And um, I would also second this idea of having wards because that Brian brought up because there are distinctive characteristics of certain parts of town 
that need to be represented at the table, and for example, as you showed with your straw poll up front, right now, as one resident outside the village puts it, there are eight people, essentially, from the 8-2 state district. There is one person from the 8-1 state district, and there's one person from the 8-3 district. That's not comprehensive or thorough representation of the people in this town, and I would urge you going forward to keep that in mind, that we have to have voices from different parts of town and it is easier to run in certain parts of town than the other, and it's no surprise to me that we have so many people from 8-2 at this table. But we need to work harder to get a more diverse voice as a whole going forward. Thank you. Is that everything? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just wondering, are you moving forward, trying to move forward with uh, um, D? Yeah. You want to try to? We're kind of and does that mean that this? It's not funny. Um, <laughs> and if I read that, that was what fourteen thousand for the facilitator. Is that well, what's you're approving tonight? Yes. Um, okay. We need to or talk trying about, to. We're flipping D and E. We, got, we, we made well, an agenda change before you were. Okay. Wrong. Yeah. I don't mean to get on that. I just wanted because, like a few other people have said, going back to the rec thing and the experience there, with outreach, and the difficulty, we can't have Kale do more videos now. Sadly. Probably because Sorry. Annie's here. <laughs> I don't know who's going to do them now? But that was powerful. They're still coming up. They're still popping up. I don't know if the fourteen thousand or whatever the figure was that was in the packet is your intended buy or number for the whole effort. But it is woefully low as far as far as I can guess as to the extent of media creation you'll need to do to educate the community on what exists now and what you want to do. So, I mean, I would, I'm not there yet, but I would guess that that would just be the facilitator fee, and maybe that's what it is, but overall budget for the media creation and push that you'll need to do just to get everybody on the same page seems, I mean, 20, 30, I'm just, you know, like, um, and Kale freelanced that. That was amazing. Yeah. But was I, guess, I guess we're not getting it back. <laughs> Anything else from the audience? I have one more thing, and I apologize for not including that beforehand. Um, there's data online that talks about even number of boards, and that was a concern when we spoke about it at the governance group, that conventional wisdom is you want an odd number. Um, the new thing that we may want to consider is that boards at Apple and Facebook, for example, have insisted on an even number of boards because it builds better discussion. People don't race to a decision knowing that they can have an odd number of votes, so let's just get to that vote. You have to tease out some of the nuances and diverse opinions at that table because you don't have sort of that crutch. And so I just wanted to offer that up because that was news to me, maybe it's not to you. Thank you. It's a very, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. All right. So we have George for the subcommittee report. And at this point, we're going to go into the next discussion that we need to have, which is the governance subcommittee and whether we feel we need to continue it or not. So, um, George, I'm going to let you talk about how you feel that might be, how we might proceed there. And first, I, I think um, I, I want to thank Dan for being here tonight. I don't, either, I don't anticipate there will be any more questions for Dan, so maybe we can let him head on back to Montpelier. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um, and and he'll, Dan will be back. <laughs> yes. Like the Terminator, he'll be back. Uh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> Um, what we want, so one of the issues that we have is do we want to continue the governance subcommittee model and as Andy referred to, you know, we, if we're going to have this more intense uh, meeting schedule, uh, joint meeting schedule, option A would be we just all handle this, uh, all ten of us during our joint meeting. In other words, interaction, so let, me, let me back up. If we're going to hire a <laughs> consultant's advisor, facilitator type uh, entity, um, is it easier for that person, entity, to work with a subcommittee or try to work with all ten of us? That's one of the questions, and I, because I think that's the important next step um, that we're looking at. 
Um, and so do we want to continue with the governance subcommittee? Uh, right now, uh, the structure has changed. Um, and we are in a period of transition on both boards. We have two new members on the select board, and we are, uh, we are going to have definitely one and probably another uh, new member on the trustees. So what's the group's pleasure? Do we want to, let's have some discussion about this. Right now, the remaining members of the governance subcommittee um, are Max, uh, Elaine, and uh, me. And Elaine was on the board representing the Essex Junction trustees. She's no longer on the trustees, so if she continued, she would be representing the select board, I guess. So that's where we are. So I think that's kind of a key step in deciding what we want to do next. Do we be, and then the next piece would be um, the RFP for a consultant uh, facilitator. So thoughts? Patrick. So coming from a 10-member board, um, I can tell you that those discussions get very, very deep and they get very, very long incredibly quickly. Um, it's rare that I get out of a school board meeting before 10 o'clock, um, you know, and we will sometimes regularly with executive sessions proceed past 11. Um, I, I think that the governance subcommittee has done a pretty fantastic job so far with the materials that I've seen presented. So my preference would be to continue that rather than having 10 members weighing in on this every time. Just for the sake of expediency, it's just there's so many voices when it comes to this that narrowing it down quite a bit and then bringing it back to a full board when there are big decisions to be made just is a, it seems logical to me. Um, I'm going to defer because I've been on it. I do feel we should continue, but someone else can have a comment. Anyway. Uh, what's the, do we, we haven't talked about what the mission will be for the, uh, this subcommittee if we form it going forward. Is it, is it mm -hmm. to, <clears throat> you know, work, work with staff to discuss or to, to work with the facilitator if we hire one kind of thing is kind of what I'm thinking. And yes. then does it continue on to craft the merger agreement based on the feedback that's gotten from that outreach? Or is it a one step at a time and then we decide later who's going to do the, the merger agreement? I'm just, just trying to get the scope of what's being asked. Um, I think your latter that choice, which is that they work with the facilitator and they work on the outreach and then we have a point where we come back to the boards and see the work that's been done and then talk about the next step, whether it's writing the charter or whatever that is. But um, if, if I could just finish for a moment. The other role I see this group fulfilling is doing the really detail-oriented work with the staff about modeling what the taxation scenario might be for each governance, you know, for the governance model, whether we do it this way, what, how much will it cost if we do it this way. So I think there's a lot of research that needs to get done, and that's what I kind of thought that this group would be doing now. I, I'll add, I, I would see it like in small chunks. I would say the immediate next step for the subcommittee would be to work with the facilitator consultant, uh, you know, technically probably continuing on after that, but if we got to the point, you know, by October where we decided, no, we want, this isn't working, we want to go back. I, you know, unlike even having an MOU, I think it could be dissolved at any time if the rest of the, the ten-member board said, yeah, we want to take it from here, so. But I think the immediate next step for the subcommittee would be to work with, as you said, with the facilitator. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Are you done? Hmm? Are you done? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not, <clears throat> I feel good about the subcommittee. Um, obviously, we need to determine who the new members are. It's got four. Do we want to keep it at four? I think those are, and um, their presentation's coming back up. I, I feel good about that. I think, um, subcommittee should 
continue with specific time slots on, the, on each agenda for updates so that there's a dedicated time that you'd be coming back and talking to those folks. I'll just add my, one, my two cents is that I think that who is on the subcommittee should be, uh, this should be decided at the next trustee select board meetings. I don't think we should decide that here. Yeah. We're going to have, uh, you, you have new members, you know, so I think it should be an internal board discussion sure. about which board, who, who you, which <coughs> members of your own board want to send. Does that, does that make yeah, sense? That makes sense. To me. So we don't have to decide that tonight, but I think we do need to decide whether we want to continue with the process. And I appreciate the work that the, the subcommittee did. Um, one of the reasons why we created the subcommittee was for the expediency sake. And if my memory serves me correctly, that didn't really happen. And I don't mean that to be critical. Um, but that it took a while to get the final report. Mm -hmm. And we just created additional meetings for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I did it because I thought we would just be that subcommittee. So I, I'd actually rather just see it be us. I see the, the workload being such that a subcommittee is needed. But they can't, as we've been, not making decisions but bringing them back to the full board. And that generates a lot of discussion in and of itself. But to, to have that discussion and expect all that extra uh, detail work to be discussed, yeah. I think is unrealistic. And I, so I think the subcommittee is, uh, is an important piece to moving this forward, particularly for a November 2020 target. I concur with Max. I think uh, the idea of continuing with the subcommittee is a good idea. I hear what Andrew's saying, but I think there is so much that um, the subcommittee can, uh, can uh, way out or filter out um, just little questions that need to be researched so then you can bring back facts that the, the whole board and it, you know together can just look at the facts you know instead of getting delving down into little things that could make a meeting super long like Pat saying we went until 11 30 at night I don't want to see that and uh, whatever we can do to expedite the process and get this going. The only piece I'd add for, for Andrew's sake is that consider that we are anticipating hiring a, a consultant, <coughs> let's call it a consultant. Um, we don't know what that person's needs are. We don't know what that person's schedule. So what we'd be saying is that our interactions with that person would be tied to a hard schedule of trustee select board meetings. So that might make it cumbersome. Uh, the subcommittee would have perhaps with just four of us would have a little bit more flexibility to meet during the day or on an evening or something like that when it's convenient. Um, so I, are there other comments, discussions about this? That's good. Well, I, well, I think we need board action here. Right? I think we want to have a vote on this. Can I just add one question? Yeah. So we are going to go to each board separately to discuss who's going to make up the committee because we have new members to take care of. I would also like each board, based on the comments that we've heard from the audience, um, we have allocated $14,000 to this. We should Each board should discuss whether that's sufficient and whether we want to increase that or keep it the way it is. Um, you're saying the number of people on the subcommittee? No, no, no. The fact that, um, that I am no longer a trustee so I am no longer on the subcommittee, okay. and our other former member is no longer on the select board. So each body needs to choose a new person. Oh, I misunderstood. Not I thought you were changing the number. Considering changing the number. Then. No, I think that I think the decision for us tonight is: to, is do we want to continue a two, a four member subcommittee with two members representing each board, each board representing two members? I think that's the decision before us, as I understand. And I, I understand there are questions in the audience, but I, I think we've got a board action here that we need to have a dialogue on and have a vote on. Uh, I, I'd be happy to have I'd be happy to have the subcommittee continue going and appoint new board members and whatnot, as long as the first meeting could happen before the end of this month. If that can't happen, then we're going to have a we're going to have a joint meeting again the beginning of May. Yeah. Sure. So, um, select board, I'd like to hear a motion about continuing the subcommittee. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Andy. I thought I saw a hand up in the audience. To yeah, but we're, we're voting. I mean, we, it's not an audience discussion opportunity. Uh, we haven't made a motion yet. So, um, okay. Culture clash. Right? 
It is a couple of questions. It's true. Um, Betsy, you had your hand up? Yeah, I'd like to know why you consider on this, this subcommittee that you're going to have, have another resident from the town outside of the village and the village be on it, because you're going to be looking at communication and the, you might have another input. I, I don't think it should just have to be your board members that are on the committee. Speaking only for myself, this is, you know, the subcommittee has been, it's contrary to popular belief, efficient at doing, <laughs> <laughs> at doing the work that we need to do. And we have focused very, very long on this. And what I would like to do is work with our facilitator, whomever we contract with, to do a very robust public input process. But the committee that works with that person <coughs> needs to be from the boards. All right, so can we have a motion from the select board regarding uh, maintaining the subcommittee, governance subcommittee? Yeah, I move the select board uh, continue with the uh, governance subcommittee meeting. Is there a second? Second. Sorry. Thank you. Patrick. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. And abstaining? Is that everybody? All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask for a motion from the trustees. I move that the trustees continue to uh, provide members for the government subcommittee. Second. Any, uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. All right. Item 5D, which is now 5B, um, approve the RFP for public engagement facilitator for the November 2020 vote on governance <coughs> change. So, Greg, would you mind walking us through the draft you provided in our packet? Yeah, so very much a draft request for proposals. Um, but basically, just wanted to give you something to pick apart and start to talk about and how you want to do the community engagement and outreach around um, getting ready for the November 2020 vote based on some of the governance proposals that were talked about earlier tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. I do want to call attention to a couple of things, uh, a few things. Um, one is timeline. Uh, the date in there talks about November 1st as being uh, a deadline for the facilitator or the professional to get something back to the boards. Um, just trying to balance a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, George's timeline, um, the concept of people being away for summer, not wanting to extend it too far before when you get into budget season and town meeting preparations. Um, so that's something that can be up for consideration a little bit. Uh, cost, $14,000 is the proposed cost. That might be a little bit ambitiously low. Um, sort of looked at the TGIA process, uh, the firearms process, and tried to get an estimate from there. Um, thinking about it more, hearing about it more, your conversation tonight, um, maybe up that to the eighteen, twenty thousand $20,000 range. Uh, also the selection process, um, I put a note in there that the select board and the trustees would choose the candidate based on the evaluation criteria. Don't know if you want to keep that, if that's something you want to delegate to the governance subcommittee. Um, and then also uh, there was mention of a steering committee in there some sort of advisory board. I think staff, my recommendation, staff recommendation would be that you have some sort of focus group. Sounds like that might be the governance subcommittee, um, but do you think there's some value to having some group that can work more closely with the facilitator and the professional? Um, beyond that, it's kind of an RFP, RFP to get out there and start um, looking for a professional who can do that and then hopefully work closely with whether it's staff, the entire boards, um, a, a more uh, focused committee, but kind of really then shape the what the engagement's going to look like, um, finalize the timeline. Uh, so again, this is just a, a draft to start talking about. Don't know if it's something that the governance subcommittee wants to pick up and focus on, if the boards want to do it, but um, this is something to get started because timing's coming up fast. I have a question about the, um, the, the budget. Is that for the facilitator or is that for the tools that this facilitator would also be using to do public outreach? Depending on who you select, it, it could be a negotiating point. Um, I think it depends on the facilitator, depends on the proposal. Sometimes you get proposals back and it's all inclusive. Other times you get something back and it's that's the cost of the professional. It doesn't include materials, doesn't include um, 
other types of things. So. Because the uh, the importance of this and the need to kind of go where we've never been able to go before, I think, yeah, 14 is not probably enough. I don't know if doubling that is even enough. Uh, but at least I would think double uh, so that we have options to be able to really find creative ways to get out there. Um, again, I don't really know what the number is, but it, my gut tells me I'm going to agree with Raj here that that's probably too low. I do. Within our community, we have an extraordinary amount of talent and intelligence and creativity for media, for if we're trying to engage our community, let's not bypass our community in the process. At Essex High School, we have an extraordinary amount of video talent amongst the students. If you want to engage our community, hire the facilitator, but also bring on board all those who have this opportunity, that, 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 that need this opportunity. Let's involve our young people in civic engagement, if I'm saying the right words, and, and, and that involves their parents, and that involves, there's so much interaction that can occur through this, and I'm not talking about it as a means to save money. I'm talking about it as a means of engagement, but it also, I feel it strongly. That's all I'm going to say now, but I have a lot to say about it. Um, I don't have a solution to the comment I'm going to make, so I apologize for that. But what struck me um, in our discussion is that it's really important that we reach thousands of people and not hundreds of people. And so on the second paragraph in the overview where it says the facilitators will organize and oversee a public engagement process that reaches as many residents as possible, I think that might just be a little too vague in order for us to ascertain, and, and for the people who are replying, to say, can I or ha do I have the experience to reach thousands of people? So I apologize, Greg. I don't know how to, to change that, but hopefully you get the gist of what I'm saying. We had had a, um, I forget who I had this conversation with, but um, we could absolutely, we could, sorry, it's getting late. In the RFP, we could um, stipulate that candidates could demonstrate or at least propose that they would reach X percent of households or X percent of registered voters. Like we could set a target, and they would have to be able to prove that they could meet that target. I mean, it'd be a performance measure, yeah. and mm -hmm. the success of which would be measured by the success of the initiative. But I mean, there are some measures we could put in here. That's great. I think we should try and do that. Right. I mean, I, I, th I look at the proposal requirements, and I'm looking at a list of recent public... So if, if we're saying the 10 of us are going to choose the person or the, the, the company or whatever, uh, we would see what they've done and look... And so that would be... We'd make a judgment on the basis of where we, whether we thought they would, they would be able to do the job. Uh, so I think that would handle it. Well, and, and I agree to some extent. Um, <coughs> I think... Being able to clarify that a little bit better will send the message to the person applying to the RFP that we are, we want something big here, bigger than our municipalities have ever done, mm -hmm. and probably bigger than some of the facilitators we've had could effectively do. So. Could we say a significant number of voters? Would that make it be, be a little more clear? Yeah, and again, I don't, I, I don't. <coughs> Thousands of residents across all of Essex? Just something a little. I mean, we could be that. I, I like what you're saying, Greg. And then once those candidates come in, we can ask them specific questions, like you know, what will you do for the rural area of our community? What will you do for our dense area of the community? I mean, just when you when you talk about reaching people in the community, like Annie said, you know, with I don't know what percentage of the population has kids going in whatever level of school, whether elementary, middle school, or high school, but that reaches many, many households. 
you could do a mailer. A mailer is you can mail it to every address, business, <coughs> residential in, in, the, in the town, including the village, uh, and reach everybody. If you call that reaching everybody, you don't have to just throw them in the trash. I mean, but it, it's a, it's going to be a com combination of a bunch of things. That from and everything. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's that daunting a task. I look. At, obviously, it's not the same scale, but. With the, with the police facility thing, with the bond issue that we brought up earlier, I think it was $8 million, George. But anyhow, that passed. And I remember working with a bunch of people on that, going to the, to the senior housing developments. Because those, those people aren't able to get out, a lot of them. They're inside. But it's important to reach everybody. And we, we did it. We went to the high school. We went to some of the events. It's possible to do it. I don't think it's that daunting. So, I, and I just want to clarify. I'm not saying it's daunting, and I'm not saying it can't be done. But we haven't done it effectively on this topic. And so I just think it needs to be very clear to the people applying to this RFP that we expect a very high level of engagement. And if you haven't done it, this is not the opportunity to, to try it. Sure. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so maybe to say to reach thousands. Of Thousand, thousands would be great. Okay. Something more than as many. Well, what, how do you quantify, how do you qualify the, the, the What's the metrics you use to, to, to determine they reach them? If they got to come back, Social they got a signature on a piece of paper. I mean, what? I, I just when you say reaching, what's is reaching? Making a phone call and leaving a message—that's reaching. I don't know. There's 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 some things you can't measure. Right. Which, you're right. Sending home flyers with the kids in their Friday folders, <coughs> not necessarily the most effective way. Social media has very specific measures that we can employ to see, you know, at least how many eyeballs have seen these things, and if we repeat it, you know. That we will look to the person we hire to guide us on those kinds of measures, and they will recommend the things that they, in their expertise, will believe will penetrate the most. Can I just make a, um, I have one comment about the RFP that I would like to change. Um, first page, third paragraph, it says the facilitators will produce a report by November 1st, 2019, that details the results of the engagement process and recommends a final governance option to bring to a townwide vote in November 2020. I would like there to be a period after the word process and then drop the rest of the sentence because it's these boards that will make the final determination about what governance model we come up with and the facilitator will gather all of the information and bring it to us and then if we see in the materials that they bring that there's an overwhelming uh, sense of what the community wants then that we will go that way but we, we I don't want it to be I don't want it to say in this proposal that the facilitator makes the decision. I just want to be very clear on that. Uh, Andrew. I have a couple of questions. One going back to the, uh, the reaching people. I think maybe some of the issue is that word or that phrase of reaches. Maybe if we replace reaches with solicits inputs from, so that, that way it's not our people just having eyeballs on it, but we're actually getting information from thousands of residents. Um, and then with the second line of the second paragraph uh, going into the third line it talks about governance structures and governance changes based on uh, three potential governance change options what I think I recall from our conversation so far is that much of the conversation has been around representation and taxation and less around governance structure so are we saying governance structure is inclusive of representation and taxation or are we saying governance structure is one charter are we saying special tax district and that's it Well, that's a hard question to answer because your governance structure, depending on on how you want to deal, if you don't see, if you don't see the taxing issue as a big deal at all, and you don't care about representation, you're just going to say we're going to at large voting, and that's it. We're not going to worry about districts. Then that takes you to kind of one, maybe points you to one governance model versus another. I mean, how you address some of those underlying issues. So I, I don't know how to answer the question. I don't know. I mean. I think you just want to be able to ask a number of these questions. Uh, you want to say, yeah, yeah, I think you want to say, yeah, look, we're, we've got two charters right now. We're going to think, we're going to, we're talking about consolidating. Are you in favor of consolidation? You have one charter, one governing board. You like that idea. That's, you so know, governing that. structure may be inclusive of and list off some. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm good. I, and to get to Andrew's point, how about under proposal requirements, you have one of them that says a a demonstrated ability to solicit, to solicit input from thousands of people. 
and you, that would be a proposal requirement. So they would they would have to show you that they've got a track record right. that they they're not just beginning to do this. They know what they're doing and they know how to reach a, a significant number of people. Solicit and receive input. Okay, so solicit and receive input. Yes, <laughs> yes, good, good call. <laughs> you got that, Greg? Yes, going, if I could jump in back to Andrew's um, point about the issues of taxation representation. Um, do you need that to be in the overview? Is it okay to put something in the background that elaborates on some of the likely issues uh, that are likely to come up, include representation, taxation, some of those things? I, I think that that's <coughs> fine. As it will also be in my mind we're talking about rating. It'll be in your mind. We're talking about rating the, the um, proposals. If I was going to apply for the job as facilitator, I would, and then I, if I got the job, I would go to Hannaford several times a day. I would go to soccer games. I would, there are ways to find our community where they're already gathered. And we all know what that is. You know what time you don't want to be at Hannaford's or do want to be at Hannaford's. You know what I mean? And there are places that we congregate as a community and the person we hire needs to go to where a community is gathered. It's 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 the most important way to find out who we are anyway. Um, I, I agree with what, what Elaine said with regard to not asking the facilitator facilitator to provide to come to the uh, final recommendation in, in the scope of work section um, uh, section four also refers to that so that's just another another change that that, that right. I think needs to be made and, and and as I recall from when we hired the facilitator for the uh, firearms uh, it, the discussion the facilitator specifically said it's not her job to make the recommendation she's only going to find information and bring it back so I, I think it, it, it you know we have existence theorem that that you know that Facilitator shouldn't be making that recommendation. The other thing is uh, we haven't talked much in this discussion about the what's referred to as the steering committee here, and I I, I, I can only assume that it would would be the um, the governance subcommittee. But I would also like it to include staff so that there's oh, folks available to. Um, and I don't know if we need you know to to, to reserve rooms or, or you know help with. Audiovisual equipment, or you know, whatever, whatever needs to uh, in discussions, or have you know, hire lawyers, or whatever we need to do. I think we need to have some staff on there. But I don't know if you know, are there two decisions, this, this two votes that we need to have? Do we need to establish? Do we need to, or, or can we just say, this is what the steering committee is going to be? I mean, if there's there's reference to a steering committee, we need to know what it is. I, um, I, I think Andy, I think we want to change the phrase steering committee and change it to governance subcommittee first of all so that we know that that's the that's the steering committee that greg is referring to the group that's going to work directly with the facilitator and i agree we should absolutely add in here that the facilitator would work with the governance subcommittee and select staff that we can designate or we could say the unified manager and his designee or we could say anything like that to make sure there's staff involved for sure Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. sorry. Um, Elaine, you mentioned Heart and Soul uh, as probably the largest outreach that's been successfully happened before, and that was four or five hundred people. Is that right. correct? Right. Um, I mean, hitting thousands of people is a scope. Yeah. I mean, even the school board doesn't hit you know that much in, in much of what we do, and most of what we do actually. Um, <laughs> I know it's been mentioned, but I, I would stress it as well. Um, someone who does this and is going to reach thousands of people is going to need access to not just social media, but print media, potentially radio media, television media, um, I mean, looking at streaming media. Um, it's it, Raj mentioned it as well, and Max, and I want to stress it, that if this includes the budget for outreach, someone who you know, like Annie suggests, would go out to Hannaford's multiple times a day. I mean, we're looking at a person and probably some person who has staff members to actually get thousands of people. I mean, you know, it's, it's a realistically large jump if we're seriously considering engaging, not just 
eyeballs on, but actually facilitating input from thousands of people. Like, I would run, I'd run an event that would get 2,500 people to it. Our budget was $8,000 for media. Um, and that was just media, and we were volunteering. Um, yeah, I mean, that. Qualitative data that's going to be hundreds of hours. Yeah. 100 hours to, if you get 1,000 comments, <laughs> how many hours will that take to collate those comments into yeah. a usable form of data? I mean, I mean, November is what, 150 days away, and we're looking to get thousands of people. I mean, that's ideally starting even from today. What, 30 new people a day, 40 new people a day that you're actually getting impact from, I mean, or input from? I mean, I think the budget is not just really low. I think it's honestly almost absurdly low. Like, yeah. if, if we either need to reduce the scope that we're looking at here of actually receiving input from thousands of people, or we need to make sure this budget number is much, much larger than it is now. I, I, we, a, a number of years ago, and I don't, I don't, I understand this isn't a, a valid comparison necessarily, but we did a survey in the village where we mailed, we had a, like a two-page pamphlet survey questionnaire with a, including a, a self-addressed envelope, stamped envelope. And we mailed it to every village resident, uh, every village household. Um, we sent out, I think, around 4,500, and we got back 1,200. Now, that cost, that cost a little over $3,000. Um, and it took um, probably about two months. Now, again, we had, we had a group that it, we didn't ask, people could put comments at the end of the survey, but really we asked questions, you know, check this box, check this box. Yeah, so we didn't, we didn't have to go through lots and lots of comments. We made it easy for ourselves. When you do that, obviously, you <laughs> lose a lot of information that, you know, you're not, there's nuances in there you miss. Um, but just as, a, just as a frame of reference, just to mention it. And I agree with you. I, I was going to say we should probably at least um, go with, I'd recommend going with Max's recommendation that we double the budget to 28000 I would want to, before agreeing to raise a budget, I would want to know that the person spending the budget is effective, efficient, and really freaking good at their job. Excuse me, using that language. Because I refuse to spend money on something that's going to net us the same thing we've already got. Agreed. Okay. But we do have to yeah. have, uh, we have to have a ballpark Agreed. to put in the RFP. So, okay. yeah. And whoever applies they're going to cost exactly what we put in there, Great. you know, so they will just say. Um, oh, okay, well, hold on just a second. <laughs> All right, have the, has everyone had their say on the, Dan? One last thing about the whole thing of when, I, I know we're talking about thousands of people. Why do we have to have thousands of people? We go to the annual meeting, and we have 300 people, they vote on a budget. Okay, I, no, I understand what we're seeing here, okay? I just want to give it reference, compare it to what's happening out there. And so you get annual meeting, you get 300 people, they vote on the budget, yay or nay, you know? And now we're saying we need thousands of people. All we need is the amount of people, more people to vote for it than against it. <laughs> and that's all we need. So to say it's thousands, I, I'm just, I just want to put some bearing on this. People get hung up on numbers. And you say 400 people with, with, with heart and soul, how many of those people were the same people over, you know, because I went to a lot of those events, I saw the same people many times over. So I don't, I don't think we really have to say it's necessarily how many thousands. We need the majority of the voting population that show up to vote. That's an excellent point. You're absolutely right. But I will say that this... I want everyone to know, though. I yeah. agree with oh, you. Oh, absolutely. That. I want everyone to be aware. Yeah. But key is getting those people that vote. We have spent so much time and effort on this. I mean, I've spent 10 years of my life working on this. I mean, it's important. And it is really important to every resident here who either their taxes might go up or they may not get the representation they feel like they need or people just can't understand why we're taking so very long to do this work. We owe it to the community to, to knock on every single door and, and do what we can. So I totally get what you're saying. We're going to set a parameter of what the vote will be, but we have to make that effort. And if it's I can, too important not to. If I can add one comment. If we're doing this in November 2020, there will be thousands of people voting. Right. Right. 
Okay, so. <laughs> That's why we chose that day. Exactly. So it's 10 o'clock. Greg has his hand up. Another option for the budget is we take it out, you do a request for qualifications. It's open ended, and you might get back some that are 20,000, you might get some back that are 100,000. Um, hmm. Looking at the, the select board and trustee annual budgets for <coughs> fiscal 20, um, you probably have more in the 25 to 35 range if you stretch it, but if it comes back and you really love a project and you want to negotiate and get into fund balance or find some other for source of funds, that is uh, something that we can consider. Will that add to the timeline of the search? No, I, I think the selection process, um, to drag it out a little bit longer, we should briefly talk about. Um, you might get two or three applications and be able to interview all of them. You might get nine or ten. And um, if you get on the high side, I'd recommend that somebody narrow that down somehow, whether that's staff or the government subcommittee or some combination thereof, to bring back the top two or three for the board's interview if the board want to select it um, on, on their own. I kind of like that. Sounds good. That's good to me. Good. Everyone like that concept? So we'll do a request for qualifications as opposed to a request for proposals. And then they tell us, but included in that, they're going to give us an idea of what they think is going to be. They'll be asked to submit a budget. Yeah. Okay. That's an okay. excellent That's suggestion, Greg. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good idea. Yes, yeah. but, uh, should we take a vote on that? Do we need to vote Are on we that? Are we voting on that? Or can we just all nod our consent and seeing nods of consent all around here. It Thumbs is up. recommended that the trustees and select board okay. authorize staff to issue a request for proposals. So um, how about a sense of each board? Select board, how do you feel about an RFQ? I like it. Andy, what do you think? Request uh, I'm confused what you're asking me. Are we going to actually vote on whether or not to authorize staff to issue this RFP. Uh, RFQ. RFQ, 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 excuse me, <clears throat> yes. Okay, so, so well, we're, we're not, the staff has not asked us to vote on it, but if we want to vote on it, we can. I think we should. Since we're talking about an appropriation, we should probably vote on it. Yeah, so, yeah. All right. yeah I can make a motion to do the um, mission okay. request for qualifications as amended. That would be appreciated. Any further questions before we vote? Okay. Can there be a motion from the select board? Okay. Andy? I move that the select board authorize staff to issue a request for qualifications for public engagement facilitator in preparation for a number November 2020 vote on governance. Second, Second please. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Trustees, same. Uh, I move the trustees authorize staff to issue a request for qualifications for a public engagement facilitator in preparation for November 2020 board on governance. Second. Four seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We're in the home stretch. <laughs> okay. Next item, item 5F, approve date and prepare for joint board strategic work session. Take away, Greg. Uh, theme of the night, or just need more. <laughs> um, Something got lost in translation. That's not what we were talking about internally. Uh, Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, sorry I said it's, I'm, I'm a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but um, we would like to talk to the boards about having a strategic work session going forward. Um, the focus would probably be Less, uh, actually less about the governance piece at this point um, and outreach and communications more so on how do you want to jointly run one and a half, two organizations, however you want to break down the town and the village. Um, that has one manager and a lot of uh, unified staff across the board. Um, there's a rough draft agenda in there to certainly be tweaked and finalized, but um, the alignment group that we have as staff uh, has talked a bit about just the amount of work that different departments are doing as we move towards alignment, consolidation, uh, if there's going to be a merger sometime after November 2020, what that might look like. Um, I think it's important for the boards to see that and just how complex it is. Um, we've talked about just some examples tonight, the AP processing that Sarah's going to present, the website. 
um, getting into budgeting, some of those decisions that really need to have input from both boards. Uh, that's when we get into budgeting, stuff like that. Some of the culture di cultural differences, um, expectations of staff, when to approach the boards, when not to approach the boards, but really just kind of touch base. And as we've been doing this for however, many, however long you Priorit want to budget. Prioritization of what we're working on and what you want to see and when you want to see it. So those, those are some of the issues. Um, and then looking to, I guess, start with scheduling a date and time to do it and just start to flesh out some of the agenda and, and um, authorize staff to find a location. Discussion? Thoughts? And a facilitator? Uh, yes, probably. That'd be our recommendation. Yeah. My only thoughts are, in looking at the locations, they all sound fantastic at the same time. The more we can keep our money local, the better, in my opinion. Right. Um, Lastly, uh, of the three days proposed, the 15th is the only one that worked for me. Other, the other, others, I'm out of state. The 15th is Essex High School's graduation. It's uh, not going to work. Because so, some of us go to that. <laughs> and I have, a, I have a gig that day with my band. Okay. And that's <laughs> <can> why we <laughs> wanted to bring this and because getting ten of you in a room plus any well, sound. I, I, let, let's, how about, I mean, how about we time. not settle a date tonight? How about we have that be part of the, of the, the, the grand how about request do, we'll send that out we're going to send staff on? You're going to figure out the date. You know we want to do this sometime in June. You're going you're gonna to get in touch with all of us and figure out a date that works for everybody. It's going to be easy. Yeah, we'll do a doodle poll on the date, but the concept. The concept. We're really just really going for the concept. I think we've got a lot of tweaking here about a lot of the, the as you said, what the agenda would be and so forth, the schedule. But the concept, does everyone like this concept that we would, we, we get out of town for the day. Okay? We get out of, I mean, and, and we don't want need to maybe go to the Basin Harbor Club. I agree with you, Andrew. But maybe we, we hightail it out of Essex for a day and, you know, um, it just it might be refreshing to, for those of us that don't get out much. I can't sit at this table for eight straight hours. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's just the idea is that we don't want to meet in the cafeteria. You know, we just want to, because we're getting our staff, we just try to have a more uh, congenial, um, collegial kind of a encounter. Thoughts? I'm all for it. I think, I, I, as I've said before, with meetings, Moving out of the norm, getting out of these, you know, the 81 Main and, and 2 Lincoln, getting out to, you know, some of the parks, a rec area or something or a facility that, that we can, yeah. you know, plug in things and do things. I'm all for getting, getting away from it. Just Particularly if we're going to give up yeah. one of our wonderful Saturdays in June, yeah. it's gonna, it better be good. Yeah. No. <laughs> yep. So, um, the, uh, the last time the select board did a thing where we talked about select board priorities, I think was December of 2015 or something like that. September, I think so. And, and we had a facilitator there, and I guess I'm just asking, the question I'm asking is, is the, what's the role, what will be the role of a facilitator? Um, because we, when we had that meeting, we, we went through an hour and a half or two hours of these feel-good exercises, and then for the last half hour, we stood in front of a chalkboard and wrote down all the things that we thought were, were important to work on. So it was a, it was a, um, a nice effort, but I think all the work happened in the last half hour. I just want to understand what the, you know, if, if the, we're going to have a facilitator, I think it needs to be useful, not, not necessarily a, a feel-good exercise. I, I, I agree with you. I kind of said, yeah, I get the facilitator, <clears throat> but I'm looking, if you're going to ask each staff member and uh, the, each elected official to kind of, talk and speak or do something, what exactly is the facilitator going to be doing for us? By the time just we go through all those people, it's the, the thing's going to be over with. I'm not sure. We're not really trying to achieve a, a, a final statement or a goal. I think we're, it's really just a, a kind of an intro, we're introducing and, and talking to each other. And I look at it for trustees, particularly if we'll have two new trustees, and for the select board, opportunity to meet staff, staff to meet us, staff to talk about some of, not just how they look at alignment, but just what's important to them, you know, what's going on. So I think it's just a more, the dialogue is really the more important 
piece. And if you play an instrument, we could, we could have a jam session. Exactly. <laughs> we could bring we can bring our instruments. If, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm gonna let Sarah go first. No. Go ahead. No, no. Go first. Thanks. So we're thinking more of a, a neutral moderator to keep us on task because if all 18 department heads come and speak to you for 10 minutes each which would be a miracle if we all only spoke 10 minutes, that's three hours out of the day with no breaks. And we absolutely are looking for some goals and directives at the end of the day, some really concrete things like, what does this joint administration actually look like? Which is a question that came up recently, right. we realized we hadn't talked about, and so we're hoping that more of a, maybe more of like a moderator to keep us on task than a facilitator, somebody who's not associated with us. As you can imagine, we you know can't give each department ten minutes because it's going to have to be short, and we need somebody who focuses us, moderates us, takes specific notes, and when somebody needs to say something but doesn't, we have seen someone like a facilitator go, "I see you, you want to say something," and draws it out of you, and or you were not specific. What do you mean by that? And we need to get to that. What do you mean when you say this? What do you envision this to look like and act like over the next whatever period of time till you get to a vote and then pass that? Because staff needs that direction. We need to know what you're in for, what your priorities are, and what you don't want to touch. And everybody needs to hear it at the same time. That's what we need from a moderator facilitator. I'm not asking them to do some lovely, let's go around the room and, and do some fall back into my hands. We're, we don't need that. We need to get going. And we're thinking somewhere in the area, for say an 8, 8.30 start, and like a 3 o'clock hard stop so that you're not burnt out. It's collegial. You all know each other. It's not that big of a, yep. you know, territory. And then have a product that can be written out at the end because when we're participating in it, we can't take notes. So we need somebody to also be able to do that and and summarize what occurred. And how, how many? How many? How many? Did you say how many people need to? How many departments? Would you say? We have 17 different village and town departments. I'd have to think so, about it. And I think that I'm 18. And I don't think all of them are going to be able to come whatever Saturday you pick, but they might write a short report. I would say if we got 12 of the 18, we'd be lucky. And if we got 8 of the 10, we might be lucky. Well, I, I, I would only say you could maybe, I would think about it a little bit more if you were saying what are the, What's the overall um, administrative, uh, what are the limits when we talk about unified administration? What are the outer boundaries of that? What does it touch on? I mean, so do you need the police chief to be involved in that discussion? Probably not. Do you need the two fire chiefs to be involved in that discussion? You know, I, I think you can eliminate maybe some people um, right off the bat. Not that they aren't valuable, but, I, it, you know, what if, if that's what you're trying to achieve, then... There are probably some departments that are so self-functioning that they don't need to be part of that, really need to be part of that conversation. I'm not saying, I'm just sort of throwing that out there. And the other piece about it is in terms of a facilitator, I get it for part of the discussion, but when you're talking about um, current and future roles in municipal space, discussion about governance options, I'm not sure, do we want to talk about governance options at, at that point? We're we going to be talking about that probably a lot. Probably so. not. It was, no. it was a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of this needs a lot of tweaking. We need here. a little tweaking, but okay. we definitely want to have a conversation okay, about fine. municipal yeah. spaces. I feel a little bit. George has been turning toward me with this weary look in his eye. I'm sorry if I'm talking to you. No, no, no. no, no, no. Um, it seems to me that some prep on behalf uh, on uh, uh, that staff could prep by combining uh, some things that are being that they're concerned about or want to know about or want to present or, or tell. And so maybe there's some thing, right? And then I'm imagining it to be like a storytelling event where you have 
five minutes, there has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end to what you're saying, and there's a timekeeper, and when you hit the five minute mark, there's a bell, and so the facilitator, so I feel like, yeah, and so that we can stay on track, stay on pace, stay on time, but also feel like you were heard and got done. And then the same would be true back the other way. Yes. So when I first read this memo, it wasn't clear to me that <laughs> this was going to involve as many department heads as could arrive, which I'm thrilled to hear that that might happen. I think the agenda should, in the interest of making sure that everyone's time is being respected and it's a summer day in June, it feels to me like the first three bullet points are ideal for a group conversation with, with as many department heads as can make it. But the bottom four, I envision those discussions being with senior staff. I don't know that the, the department heads need to be present for that stuff. And some of it I envision for just the boards. So. I, I would like the, the um, specifics about each bullet item, the purpose of each bullet item to be itemized as well, because I don't want to waste anyone's time, but we also don't want to, a retreat is a valuable thing, and so we want to maximize the board time as well as the staff time. I guess that's important. Okay. So, can you read just the concept? So we yes. just want to put the concept. Okay. So are we saying yes for a facilitator then? Or? Yeah, I guess so. The way Evan put it. Yeah. Uh, with with the size, it so many yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. conduct and yeah. I don't want to have to bring that whistle. All right. So um, you're going to send a doodle for the date. Yeah. All right. And we uh, need to. I think our goal would, our, obviously our goal would be to have all 10 elected officials. We may have to settle for something slightly less yeah. than that. That's right. And then obviously there's senior uh, management and then catch as catch can with some department heads, but at least get a, at least a summary report yeah. for a packet. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're asked, we're being asked to authorize Unified manager to hire a facilitator. So, are we ready to vote on that? All right. So, select board, would one of you like to make a motion that to that effect? Andy? I move that the select board authorize the unified manager to hire a facilitator for the event. Second? That's for the strategic work session event. Just for clarification. For the strategic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Trustees, same. Please. I'll make the same motion for the trustees. Okay. I'll second that. Yeah, no second. Any further discussion? <laughs> tired. All in favor? Aye. 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 You can still come, boy. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's a public meeting. Yeah. Opposed? It's a public opposed? opposed? Anyone opposed? Okay. And, and did, did we also? Did, does that include also the, the first recommendation for the, the date, or is that? They're going to send a doodle. Oh, okay. Yeah, it really is good. Yeah. And I, I would just also mention. I, I kind of uh, the Basin Harbor Club is kind of pricey, um, in the kind of far, but uh, Grand Isle Lake House maybe not, I, or some other place. You and know? cheap. Maybe the Inn at Essex would be. Yeah. Quick uh, nod of the heads up again. Is there openness to a weekday retreat? All day. Depends on the day. Depending on the day. Depends on the day. All right, we'll, 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 we'll check yeah. them out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That was clear. Well, oh, let's throw them on the Jew. I have zero Saturdays in June, but I have a lot of Fridays. Yeah, I was going to say Fridays. Pretty cool. We'll throw Friday into the doodle. Throw some Fridays in there. Sure. Okay, thank you. I didn't realize that. Yeah, drink with that. <laughs> All right, that was a long list of things to talk about. Thank you. Yep. We have just two more items. Would anyone from the select board like to move to either remove an item from the consent agenda or approve the consent agenda? I move the select board uh, approve the consent agenda 
with comments. Anyone want to second that? Yes. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Any comments? Any, any comments? Okay, point of order. <laughs> Some new here. If we're if we're approve, I asked if we were going to approve or take anything out. And, and I so said, you move. I'm assuming we're going to approve them all. So now we're going to discuss whether we're approving or removing. Well, we can have discussion if you have okay. questions about anything. Any discussion of the consent agenda. Hearing none. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, do I hear a motion from the trustees? <laughs> I'll move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Uh, any further discussion? One quick thing. I'm just going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting for the minutes. You can still, um, you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to abstain. You can still, you can still, you can still vote. You, you, you do you not, you don't have to abstain. So any good. further discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, and the last item is the reading file with the first portion being board member comments. Andy, did you just you just did this? Well, I I, I was it was just a, a just a slight impropriety because if they wanted to make if the trustees wanted to make any changes to the minutes that were in the consent agenda, we would then have to approve them after the, afterwards. But it didn't yeah, happen. It, so it didn't happen. So, just, but something to think about for next time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, the trustees already approved, right? Yeah. Had you guys already seen those minutes? No. 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 So we probably uh, should have done that. Mean, in the last joint meeting? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Any comments, board members? It's getting late. I just want to say thank you. Lori, this is fabulous. your last meeting with us. It is. Thank you it's so been much. Great. Especially with the trustees and the staff, but it's like we're two of the last couple of years. We'll miss you. Good luck at the state house. Yes, thank you for all you do all the time. Please keep coming back. Oh, I'll be in that audience oh, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> I look Please forward to it. it. <laughs> All right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Trustees? Oh, sorry. Second? <laughs> Second. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Trustees? Move adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Aye.